Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to members of the public um, and to the members of the committee. Um, and to members and to our officers who are here. Uh, I'm Pauline Grove Jones and I'm the chair of this committee. Um, and if you haven't attended one of these meetings before, I know some of the public have, um, I just want to ask the officers to introduce themselves. They will present the reports and they are here to offer technical advice. So if I could ask from Jeff and Round, please. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jeff Lyon. I'm the development manager at North Norfolk. Good morning, my name is Russell Stock and I'm a team leader in the planning department. Good morning, I'm Lauren Gregory, Democratic Services Officer. Good morning, I'm Alice Walker, Planning Officer. Good morning, Chairman. My name is Philip Rosen. I am the Assistant Director of Planning at North Norfolk. Good morning, I am Nikki Debbage. I am the Housing Strategy and Delivery Manager. Good morning, I'm Stuart Busy. I'm the Viability Consultant at Council. Thank you very much. And to my right. Good morning, I'm Fiona Croxon. I'm a solicitor to the council. Thank you very much. Um, before we start the formal business, can I please, as ever, draw attention to the fact that if the fire alarm goes off, it's the real caboodle. So you'll notice that the exits are, I'm going to do my, my fire drill here, exits either side. Please don't uh, use the lift, use the stairs down and uh, congregate either in the front or the rear of the building. Um, if you have mobile phones, could you please just check them now to make sure that they are turned off or they're on silent. And if we do need to, we will go for a, a coffee break about 11ish. We'll see how we go. And the conveniences are outside in the foyer. Um, and I've also got down here, if we're still going at 12.15, we'll see if we need a lunch break, but I, I don't know. I don't, I think we'll probably be okay. Right, that's that formal business over and done with. Um, I now go to the agenda. <coughs> Apologies for absence, please, Lauren. Thank you, Chairman. Apologies for absence have been received from Councillor Fitch Tillett. And did you want me to go on to the second night? Yes, good. Just yep. carry on. Uh, as a substitute, Councillor Harry Blathwaite is present. Thank you, Harry, for standing in. Um, now, the minutes for the 23rd of March. I'm going to make, I hope, a, a positive assumption that you've all looked at the minutes. Are there any queries or corrections? Yes, Councillor Brown. Good, uh, good morning, Chair. Good morning, everybody. Uh, yes, page 13, Chair, um, two paragraphs at Roman 6. Uh, I'm described as the portfolio holder for housing. I used to be. I've got that T-shirt, but I am, in fact, now the portfolio holder for planning and enforcement. So if that could be amended. Yeah, please. Um, Laura will uh, correct that. Um, I don't think there are any items of urgent business. Uh, none have been received. Right. Uh, the order of business is as it's printed. Declarations of interest. Anybody got anything? Oh, approve the minutes. Hands up if you will approve the minutes. All right, okay. Now you see, I knew I've been sitting here saying I always forget the declarations of interest. So this time I've remembered them, but I forgot. <laughs> Anybody with declarations of interest here? Are you speaking, Tim? On... Uh, yes, on two, two of the applications. Thank you. All right. Right, that's fine. So we now go straight into the first application, which is on page 21, Holt RV forward stroke 22 forward stroke 0308, variation of conditions. And um, I'm going to ask our officer, uh, Russell Stock, to speak. introduce this, please. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So this application is returning to committee today following deferral from the February meeting. 
The updated report, starting on page 21 of the agenda, provides a summary of the conversations and agreements which have taken place since the February meeting. As set out within the summary section of the report on page 23, an agreement between flagship and Hopkins Homes has been reached, which would see flagship purchase the originally proposed 23 affordable dwellings on this site. Various forms of grant funding and section 106 monies would be used to support this purchase. It is important to make clear that the developers affordable housing contribution on this site would remain at 0% and the agreement reached between the parties is separate to this planning application. <laughs> Following discussions with Homes England, our housing and legal teams, it is not possible to secure the 23 dwellings to be purchased by flagship within an amended legal agreement. And there are grant funding limitations that prevent this. The details of the recommendation for approval for this application are set out on page 23 of the agenda. The previous report, which was before members in February, is appended at page 25 and a list of draft conditions in the event of an approval is appended at page 37. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, I have a town uh, council speaker, Maggie, Maggie Pryor, if you'd like to come up, please. You know how that works now, Maggie? The little man. Ah, no, I think it's the sorry. Man. I don't didn't recognise the little man. <laughs> It'll be anything. You have three sorry. minutes, Maggie. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I'm here to stress the magnitude of the original condition of planning permission, which actually secured this permission. This simply cannot be ignored. There was no justification in the claim regarding contaminated land. If a thorough assessment wasn't sufficiently explored regarding effects on costing, this is entirely in the hands of the developer. As for the financial position, one must ask what on earth could have possibly happened in the months after the S106 was signed to bring about such a huge financial challenge. This is not convincingly evidenced. Being told to now accept that another company will come on board and take over the 23 affordable houses is fraught with risk, primarily because there are no details offered as to exactly how these homes will fit into the so-called affordable criteria <coughs> or um, the bands of the criteria, and will the designs uh, suitably fit within those bands? I read that Hoss Hoss Hopkins will still gain a price very near market value. This is not the prime criteria. The prime consideration here is the desperate need for provision, provision of affordable homes in Holt. It is not for the protection of the full 17% profit for the multi-million pound development company. What stands out is that every element of risk being pushed, is being pushed onto our shoulders with none being taken by the developer. I fail to see how this is in any way acceptable. This is the very case where the development committee should be saying enough is enough and refusing the application from Hopkins unless they can legally guarantee there will be fair allocation of social housing, rental and shared ownership provided in 23 dwellings. The committee is permitted to refuse a sec section 73 application if it has considered the harm that will be done to the area concerned alongside the harm claimed by the developer. No believable evidence has yet been provided which outweighs the harm that will be done by granting this request. The developer has tried piece by piece to rid himself of the responsibility and the cost of supplying any affordable houses and this is just grossly unjust. The uplift clause is absolutely no substitute for the number of affordable homes lost. As for Section 106 funding being brought into the equation, this will once again deprive the residents of Holt. This money cannot be spent twice, so all the allocated S106 items would therefore be lost. You, the members, decide the allocated weight of information received. Please be particular cognizant of the very harmful effects that allowing this application to be granted will bring, not only to Holt, but across North Norfolk by making this a precedent in perpetuity. Thank you for your time.
Oh, well time there, Maggie. If you'd like to return to your seat. <laughs> I have one objecting speaker, Gemma Harrison. Is she here? If you'd like to come up, please, Ms. Harrison. You also have three minutes from the time you start speaking. <laughs> I am Gemma Harrison and I'm the Secretary for Holt Housing Society. We currently have 49 applicants on our waiting list. The majority of these applicants were born in Holt or have parents living in Holt. Many are currently living in Holt but on sofas, in spare rooms and in converted dining rooms. Many have started their own families while still living with their parents and they can't afford to rent or buy on the open market. Therefore, affordable housing on this site is not a nice to have but a have to have. We note the proposal for flagship to purchase 23 affordable houses for district-wide need and welcome the efforts by NNDC and flagship to secure affordable housing on this site. But I remember the Section 106 discussions on this site well, having been involved in a previous role as an officer in Norfolk County Council, and they are a far cry from what lies in front of us today. Is this the future of development in North Norfolk? Is this what we should all come to expect? In a profit-driven business, are developers simply using the planning system to their own advantage? Or do they still have a responsibility to deliver on an agreement, a responsibility as a house builder to ensure they're building houses for people that need them? Hopkins Ethos, taken from their website, says they don't just build homes, they build communities. They state that there are no shortcuts and there's no compromises in their pursuit of excellence. Noting that Holt's land values and house prices are some of the highest in the district, it is worrying whereby a develop development, even with the contaminated land problems encountered here, can't be made to be profitable. What hope do we have elsewhere? It is for you to decide whether Hopkins should be allowed to back out of their Section 106 promises. But if you do decide to support the application today, Holt Housing ask if an agreement isn't reached within three months that a further independent viability assessment is carried out and that Holt Housing are given the opportunity to secure some affordable housing on the site for local people. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to return to your seat. <clears throat> we have one supporting speaker, um, Jonathan Lieberman, if you'd like to come up. Sorry, please. Chairman, we have another objecting speaker first. Have, oh, I beg your pardon. I'm so sorry, Jonathan. I, we have um, Martin Beatty, Batty. Mr. Beatty, is it, or Batty? Yeah. Beatty. No, Beatty. 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 Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm basically here because lots of people are very angry about this particular application and what's going on. Um, I live, I grew up in the town, and we used to play on that site. And it, yes, it is heavily contaminated. It was a piss hole. It's, it was a scrap yard. And on top of that, it was a rubbish dump. And it was like that for years and years and years. I don't see how Hopkins could possibly not know that that place was so heavily contaminated that it's going to be a problem, sir. I really don't. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, I don't know how we're going to proceed from where we are. Um, the idea of um, flagship doing what it's doing is good, but if Hopkins are not going to back down at all on this, it's just wrong. It's, it's really just wrong. And that's all there is to it. And lots of people are very angry about it. I'd hope Hopkins being a a responsible developer would maybe change their mind and maybe take this on the chin. That's my lot for now. Thank you, Mr. Beatty. If you'd like to return to your chair. Is no one else speaking, objecting them? No. Before I move on, Jonathan, I'm so sorry if you'd like to come up again. Does Jonathan Lieberman supporting? Three minutes. Good morning, members. My name is Jonathan Liebman. I'm the head of planning at Hopkins Homes. Firstly, we recognise this has been a challenging application, um, but we're here uh, to move forward positively. And we appreciate the council's proactive uh, approach to finding a solution to the issues raised. 
Since February, we've engaged constructively and positively with both your offices and flagship homes. Uh, and we're pleased that the latest proposal would enable us to deliver all 23 affordable homes on the site in accordance with adopted policy and the requirements of the approved scheme. So just picking up on some of the comments raised by the town council and the objectors, I think there's perhaps a misunderstanding but effectively affordable housing would be delivered on the site, albeit not via the sections 106, but via different means. So we would enter into a deed of variation, which would effectively uh, amend the section 106. And we've held uh, positive discussions with the council's solicitor uh, in, in that regard. So those uh, discussions are ongoing and yeah, they have been positive. So effectively we would build the uh, affordable homes and they would then be transferred over to flagship in the same way as if it was via the section 106. Uh, so the section 106 deed of variation would um, include the tenure mix etc so it's the same tenure mix it's the same um, tenure and mix so in effect it is the same proposal albeit it's just been delivered by a different means so Hopefully this would be seen actually as a positive in that we've been able to work with the public sector to find a solution to what has been a difficult site. So in summary, uh, we appreciate the efforts made by all the parties uh, to find a solution that will enable the delivery of the affordable housing. And we do hope that you'll be uh, able to support the application today. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to return to your seat. There are two local members. I see Georgie is here. Would you like to come up, Georgie? Do you want to speak there? From there? Okay, if you want to. Yeah. Three minutes is, well, five minutes, I think, for you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first, I'm going to begin by saying I agree with the excellent arguments that have been made by representatives of Holt. But I am not happy with the way this application was considered at the last meeting. It didn't seem right that the assistant head of planning received messages from Hopkins Homes during the meeting and passed them on to committee members as part of their deliberations. This would not happen for an application from an individual resident, and it should not happen for a large developer either. It didn't feel right. It didn't look right. And in my opinion, it was not right. Nonetheless, I thank the planning officers and councillor Wendy Fredericks for their successful negotiations with Hopkins Homes, and I welcome the provision of 23 affordable homes in this development, but with the caveats outlined by councillor Pryor. However, it should never have been in question. It is outrageous that it has only been enabled through grant funding sources, sources which will now be unavailable for other much needed schemes of social benefit. Hopkins Homes have preserved their guaranteed 17.5% minimum profit margin at the expense of others. They say on their website, we help build communities. But do they? There is a lot of development going on in Holt, but I don't see communities being built. I see more second homes and holiday lets, but I don't see many young families and local people moving into the new houses. I don't see a new supermarket that can be easily accessed by the people who will be living in this new development. I don't see nearby chemists or doctors or petrol stations or any of the other supporting infrastructure that communities need to thrive. Hopkins Homes say on their website, we do what is right to the highest possible standard. I'm not questioning their standards, but I am questioning their definition of what is right. Right by whom? Right by their shareholders, perhaps. But I would question whether they have done right by the people of Holt. Remember, they've only agreed to sell the 23 houses to flagship at close to market value. If their application had been refused and they appealed the decision, it would have cost them a lot more. So I do not think this small concession has been made out of the goodness of their hearts. And lastly, here is another quote from Hopkins Homes' website. We are trusted by communities and by local councils. Well, 
After this shabby application and its cobbled together resolution, I say to Hopkins Holmes, not any more. Thank you, Georgie. Um, and there is another uh, local member, um, Eric Vardy. Is he not speaking? Okay. There's no applicant. Nothing's come through. Right. I now open up the discussion to the floor. Um, Wendy, do you want to speak now? Okay. This is uh, Wendy Fredericks. She's not a member of the committee, but she is the portfolio holder for, for housing. Yes, Wendy. Good morning. Uh, good morning, members. Good morning, members of the public. I am... Wendy Fredericks, and I'm very honoured to be the portfolio holder for housing and benefits at North Norfolk District Council. I'd like to pay tribute to the flagship and also my dedicated team of housing strategy uh, officers for negotiating this deal. So building communities is very important, very important to put on your website, really important. However, the company that does the viability reports for Hopkins Homes and also other developers don't actually feel the same. Just to quote from their website, the provision of affordable housing on new developments significantly affects land value. We have significant experience in achieving results and add value to landowners and developers in this area. If this is to the point that the scheme is no longer viable and provided a robust economic viability testing, then a mix of affordable housing can be reduced or eliminated. In their bullet points, they have recent examples which include removing the provision of affordable housing altogether, making substantial reductions in the provision of affordable housing, altering the balance of tenures to substantially increase shared ownership, shared equity, and substantially reduction in off-site commuted payments. Wow. So I'm going to say as portfolio for housing, this stops now. I'm not only going to say it to Hopkins Homes, I'm saying it to every single developer that comes to this council with this mentality. I am putting things in place that stops this from happening. When you put in an application, there will be a viability report. There will be soil samples. It will be checked and double checked by our independent advisor over there. We will not be put in this position. The people of North Norfolk deserve better. They deserve places to live. Their, their communities are being eradicated by this company and developers. It stops here. I will not have it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fredericks. Um, is anybody wish to speak from the floor here on this particular application? Uh, yes. Who? Is it just you, Sarah? Yeah. Thank you, Sarah Butikova. Um, you know, on the face of it, not a, you're not a member, but uh, you wish to speak as what? As, as a member of the council and as a member who sat at the February meeting of this uh, when this was debated. OK, that's fine. I'll allow that. Thank you. Because I think we weren't in all. We weren't given all the facts at that time. OK, fine. OK, so on the face of it, you know, you think, well, what's not to like? It's been our officers have worked very hard uh, to find a solution to this issue. But it's not what it it's not what it looks like that counts. It's what it is. And the essence of this meeting involves a conflict between protecting the profit of a developer against protecting a planning obligation for affordable homes that made a development acceptable in planning terms. Would the committee at the time have accepted this application for development if they hadn't had that affordable homes argument? The argument that the developer is not liable for risk that threatens profit and that if a subsequent viability assessment fails to return a 15 to 20% profit, then developers could go back 
to the local planning authority to argue that they should not be required to contribute to specified conditions. It doesn't really hold water, does it? The development committee would not have approved the application without a planning application, a planning obligation, excuse me, of 45% affordable homes. Paragraph 55 of the NPPF states, local planning authorities should consider whether otherwise unacceptable development could be made acceptable through the use of conditions or planning obligations. I would suggest that when this was decided, that was done. Paragraph 58 of the NPPF states, the weight to be given to a viability assessment is a matter for the decision maker, having regard to all the circumstances in the case. Well, I too have seen the, the uh, Pathfinder website page, and it worries me greatly that we are in a state where we are allowed, companies are allowed to make those kind of statements about getting rid of affordable housing. There's a lot to be done there, I think, by our MP and by our government to get that corrected. So are we saying today that it's right that we will take the risk away from a developer and we will handle the risk for the developer? Because when we build a house ourselves, if we get something wrong, we have to pick up the cost. We have to make it right. So why, why should this council take on the risk for Hopkins Homes and in, in doing so, adversely impact residents of North Norfolk? So I would say this is not a perception, you know, this is not an acceptable change. We need to stop this now. And I have to say, I would ask and urge members to really think seriously about whether it, you know, in all planning conscience, they can approve this application. I know why we're frightened. We're frightened because we think we're going to be attacked for a lot of money if this goes to appeal. I understand that. And I also understand we have to protect the public purse. But if we don't stop now, when will we stop? Um, now, uh, Councillor Pierce. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, first of all, uh, go over a little bit because I think it's important for the members. I thought that the conduct of Hopkins at February meeting was absolutely appalling. Uh, they couldn't grace us with their presence, but they can certainly contact via email and look in on what's going on. Why couldn't somebody be here? I think that shows bad slight and bad disrespect to this authority. So we come to the situation. I thought that the deferment was a good thing because it gave people time. Uh, something's come out of it, of course, but it isn't what we want. I think Hopkins today, and I want this minuted, please, it must be laughing their heads off. They put a gun to our head expecting us to pull the trigger. We are in a situation that if we don't allow it, we lose the housing. If we do allow it, we're criticised because we've taken the risk away from a developer and given it to somebody else. I just think that's appalling. That's what that's coming very close to insider trading because I'll guarantee a profit, then I'll go into business. Otherwise, I'm not going to do it. I think it stinks. And at the end of the day, Madam Chairman, I'm sorry if my words echo a bit hard, but I've campaigned for low cost housing for Norfolk families is over second home since I became a councillor. And that view is still held today. I don't think people actually realise, with the possible exception of our members that serve Holt, how many people in Holt actually live in rented or social type housing is more than 50%. But many people don't know that because the town looks prosperous, looks very pretty and looks very affluent being keeping its Georgian marks. We need a new, we need a new way forward. And I'm disgusted at Hopkins because they should have done their research. This was a contaminated site. They knew that all along. And I do take the point, this is not politics. Politics um, doesn't come here. 
more care should have been taken by Hopkins to look at the land, look at the situation, and maybe not even bid for it if that's how they feel. I'm so angry, it defies description. And uh, all I will say is, I do think the officers have done well. And I think Mr. Relson was in a situation, if I, you know, look at it, where he had an open contact to the planning person at Hopkins and had to relay the information. Why couldn't that person come here and listen? It would have stopped all this. No, Madam Chairman, I think we should have the guts to say no. Thank you, Councillor Pierce. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, ma'am. I mean, we desperately need these houses, but the way that this has been orchestrated is, is disgraceful and um, I'm very disappointed. Um, can you tell me what the, the mix of Section 106 and grant funding is for the, the purchase of the affordable housing so we can assess how much damage it's going to do I'll pass the future so projects? Years. Thank you. Um, yes, I can pick that point up. I can tell you what the NNDC grant um, funding is. What I can't tell you is what flagship are putting in with Homes England grant, because I do not know that that's for their business decisions. So we are putting in two different pots of money, £660,000 worth of Section 106 receipts. And just to clarify from an earlier point, those are not other Section 106 contributions that would have gone to this scheme. These are previously accrued Section 106 receipts that we've received in, in lieu of on-site affordable housing provision from past developments. So they're 106 receipts that we already hold that can only be used to help fund affordable housing. We are also putting in some other government grant funding that we've received for a specific purpose to deliver some social housing in the district. Um, so that has no impact on the funding that we hold, and that's around about 700,000. So it is just short of 1.4 million pounds of NNDC derived grant that is going into this scheme. Thank you, Nikki. Is, is that clear, Victoria? Okay. Um, Councillor Lloyd. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank Hopkins for actually turning up on one of their um, major applications for a change. I mean, that's, um, that's, that's very good of them to do so on this occasion. Um, I think it's to echo some of the other comments, it's an appalling way to conduct business. I believe that NNDC should take a stance against this sort of behaviour by developers. Um, I'm extremely concerned about any precedents that this shocking case may present. Um, and I'll be happy to propose refusal. Thank you, Nigel. But we leave that to one side we have to go with the officer's recommendation first of all so now um councillor Henry. well thank you madam chairman this is raising a, a whole raft of issues in my mind i mean how have we reached a situation in this country where developers are guaranteed an excessive profit it is crazy they should take the same risk as any other business but no Government strategy says, yes, you can make agreements, but you can walk away from them if you're not making this vast profit to feed your shareholders. But Hopkins in particular are showing nothing but contempt for the people of Holt. And I suspect from their recent actions on Norwich Road site, where they're killing off the biodiversity, they will treat North Morsham in the same way very shortly. This is not a company that cares for the community. It cares for its profits only. What we've been offered here is a very nice fudge. Hopkins walk away with the money. Local people at least will get access to some rented housing, but not housing they can afford to buy. We have spending S106 monies basically to give Hopkins profit. You know, the whole situation is despicable. Developers should stick with what is agreed. They should not be able to walk away and treat Local people with contempt, which is precisely what I think Hopkins are doing. Say no more. Thank you. Um, Councillor Kershaw. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think I mentioned at the last meeting that I was, I was very disappointed there were no representatives of Hopkins attending. And the way that meeting was carried out, I, I thought was disrespectful. Um, 
the comments, you know, we've, we've seen what they say on their website. I mean, I, I would, you can put a lot of things on their website, but they do not seem to stand behind their own philosophy or state of philosophy. Um, I think our office has done a phenomenal job to try and put a solution together here. But for NNDC to end up subbing a developer to the tune of £1.4 million pounds is despicable. I mean, my, my I have worked in the private sector and business all my life and never would I have that guarantee and be allowed. You, you, you stand and fall by your decisions. And I think um, I'm disgusted at the attitude of Hopkins Homes in this situation. We desperately need affordable houses, but these homes aren't even affordable. They're, they're, they're close to market price when they're being sold back to flagship. There's been no, as far as I can see, um, give from Hopkins. And I think they're treating this council uh, as a walkover. And I, it's, it, I just find it, the whole thing despicable. Sorry. Thank you, Richard. Um, Councillor Toy. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't know if anybody can, um, did you say probably Fiona, it, it, was, um, it was mentioned early on about section 73. I think our first speaker spoke about section 73. Um, I, I don't, can, was, it, was that from some, someone here? I, I just wanted some clarity on what this section 73 was. Yeah, sorry. It's, yeah. Got it. As I understood it, okay. and I may well be wrong, that the um, this is what the, this new change is coming in under. They're trying to put it under what's called Section Seventy Three, and it's mentioned in your papers. I yeah. did double check it. Y yeah, I um, yeah. wanted a bit more clarity okay. yeah. On, yeah. on what, That's what that I meant. Can do that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. A Section Seventy Three application is where you have your planning permission, but you want to amend certain yeah. conditions of that planning permission, and therefore you submit a Section Seventy Three application where the um, council are enabled to look at. Uh, the proposed changes that the amended conditions would bring about and consider those aspects of it. And essentially, uh, if a Section 73 application is granted, it's simply like a second planning permission. It's a standalone yeah. planning uh, permission, which is granted, um, uh, which would be in this scenario. Um, it was about the conditions of it. I, I, there, was, there was some mention about the, the, the conditions it needed to, uh, it, yeah. yeah. I just wanted to understand that a bit better. Thank you. Okay, Jeff can come to write the Thank specific you. conditions, but that's yeah, the yeah. theory behind it. Uh, I, I don't want to the specific conditions, but in terms of the section seventy-three, that's the application that's before you today. Of is course, a section yeah. Seventy-three. So, so they're looking to vary the terms of the conditions yep, that were attached that. to the previous application. So that's what this is. We, we, we as a committee are considering this. It's a brand new application, so okay. it's, the only thing that's tied back is the time limit for implementation of the, of the initial permission. So it's a brand new permission. We have to look at. Every, we are told to look at the things that have been just uh, there as part of the condition, but we have to look at everything as well because we're in effect granting a whole new permission. Okay, so it would would have to be considered if if we were doing this as has been said by people, and it had no affordable housing, and it was before us, we could potentially have turned it down for that reason as an application. Potentially, I'm not saying you would have. But, but. I mean, that's part of the planning considerations. We're, yes. we're looking at what are the we what's it? the situation before us now. Okay. We, we've had viability evidence from the applicant saying they can't provide any affordable housing. It's a matter of judgment for you as a committee weighing up all the issues, whether you, whether you consider that you can be persuaded by the argument and accept 0% affordable housing. There are other a list of 106 obligations that the applicant is also making contributions to. There's over £300,000 of other 106 contributions. It's not just affordable housing but you're the, the issue for you as a committee so do, do you are you content to accept zero percent affordable housing on the basis of the viability evidence that's been put forward okay no okay. The, the government position as i outlined last time in february it's it's a set of rules that are set out by government and we have to work within the framework that's laid out by government whether we like it or not at times and and that's unfortunately the game the rules of, of the game that we yeah. have to play with um, and that's why the advice we've given to you is the one that we think we should yeah. accept the proposition. We spent a lot of time negotiating since February to try and find a solution. And I think we found 
a pragmatic way forward. We might not like it, but I think it's probably the best way to deliver 23 affordable dwellings at considerable public cost. But it's a way of getting those affordable dwellings on the site that wouldn't otherwise be guaranteed if we go to appeal and uh, and take that risk. There's no guarantee that we will get these 23 affordable dwellings. No, no, I I accept those arguments. And and, and that, that wasn't the challenge. I just wanted to understand because the way it was mentioned before that there was conditions in there that, that would actually support our turning it down. And I needed to understand so I could balance out both sides of the argument. And, and I absolutely have no I, I only praise actually for officers the way they've worked, all of you, for, for trying to find a solution to this. And I thank you for that. However, as many others have said, um, for Hopkins Homes to sit here this morning and said it will enable Hopkins Homes to deliver, they're not going to deliver anything. They're going to build houses. They're a choice of words. And actually, uh, from housing today in January 2022, Hopkins Homes was bought by a private equity investment firm. They're not a housing company. They're in it to make profit. And since then, where Hopkins Homes have worked with us before, and we've had Section 106 money from Hopkins before, uh, from something that was, I think, was it outline plan in 2017? And then we'd had a final approval, I think, for the detail here in this committee during my time here. Um, we've now gone to this position as well, where they're just milking it from us. And unlike many others, this is about us keeping private equity firms in profit and it's not right and, and, and I find that really difficult and the fact that if we're t- taking this as a new application effectively with the section 73 it would not have even have come to us without a percentage of affordable homes therefore I would not be able to support the recommendation in front of us thank you Thank you, uh, Councillor Toy. I'm now going to ask um, Officer Rousen before coming to you, Andrew. Thank you, Chairman. Speaking as the Assistant Director of Planning for North Norfolk, I think it's really important to emphasise that this is an issue for members today for you to make the decision on. You will make that decision on the basis of the officer's recommendation and the background information that you've heard and the speakers that have been in front of you today. The key issue is the matter of harm that would arrive if members are minded to refuse the application. To understand that harm, you need to also consider the other matters that Mr. Lyon has represented earlier on that are going to be delivered via the Section 106 in terms of infrastructure investment. You also, members, need to understand that there is proposed to be an uplift clause that will be part of these proposals that will deliver potential profits back into the delivery of affordable housing in Holt. I would also ask Chairman that we take a brief representation from our housing manager to explain exactly the terms under which the affordable housing provided by flagship will be delivered on this site. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify, there's been a couple of mentions about whether the affording, the, the housing will be genuinely affordable. The housing that we're enabling through NNDC grant and flagship through Homes England grant, the only difference is the funding route to it. The homes that will be provided will be exactly the same as the 23 that were originally envisaged. They will be exactly the same 23, the same tenure, and they will be let and sold on exactly the same basis so that 80% of them will be affordable rented properties. It will have no impact on the rent or anything like that, the route of the funding for the properties. Um, and 20% of them will be shared ownership homes where applicants can buy as little as 10% as a starting share. So I just wanted to clarify that the nature of the affordable housing has not changed. What has changed is the way it is being delivered. Clearly, previously, the aim was to deliver it through largely through developer contributions that enabled flagship, and it was to be flagship who were to purchase the homes originally. Flagship would have bought it originally with considerable developer subsidy so they could buy it without the need for public subsidy. That situation clearly is we're recommending it has changed and there will be very limited developer subsidy put into these homes. Instead, it will be largely funded through Homes England and NNDC grant funding as well as borrowing by flagship. So I hope that clarifies. 
Could, could I just say something as well through the report that although um, Homes England have made it very clear that the Section 106 agreement as revised cannot, because of the terms of the grant funding, refer to uh, the obligations that these 23 houses be affordable, we are working behind the scenes that there will be a private agreement between the council and flagship, that flagship will always provide these properties um, as affordable housing. So in fact, what um, through the officer's hard work will be delivered, will be 23 affordable houses on site. But as Nikki rightly says, it's just through a different mechanism. And we do understand the officers, uh, sorry, the members' frustration. We really do. I think, the, you know, the fallback position is that these 23 affordable houses have been secured through a different mechanism and we do realize the the frustration of members that this different mechanism has come about thank you to the officers for their comments um, i now go to councillor brown thank you madam chair um a speaker's portfolio holder for planning and enforcement as well as a member of the committee um in february i voted for deferral I wasn't one of those who voted for refusal in the hope that we could get round the table and actually invite Hopkins to engage with us more proactively than they did in that meeting in February, um, in the hope that we could um, agree a scheme that actually may alter the, the layout, notwithstanding that the uh, scheme is already under development. And uh, I had an opportunity as I watched a property being demolished next to the new build on the frontage to Hempstead Road last Friday to speak to somebody on site and the message has gone out that there will be 23 affordable homes from the management at Hopkins Homes so uh, draw your own conclusions as regards um, that information. Um, it's sad that we're in a situation where we're robbing Peter to pay Paul. We're actually taking Section 106 monies from uh, the Gresham uh, school site um, and transferring it admittedly to be defrayed in Holt, which is um, to be, you know, applauded in a way. Um, but we have a system in, and this is for government to address. It's okay for developers to play by government rules, but the rules are patently wrong. As has been said by Councillor Heinrich, there are very few professions, industries, businesses that are guaranteed a profit return. And I don't see really why developers should be in a special category, unless, of course, they derive um, un unseen benefits from lobbying government in certain financial ways. And I wouldn't want to speculate and accuse the applicant today of being in that category, but we do know about it. So uh, it, there is a smell about the arrangements that developers are allowed to play fast and loose. Um, I just want to refer to Mr. Lieberman's address this morning. He, he neatly sidestepped the issue of contamination on this site which has really instigated this application uh, and has prompted a revisit of the, of the viability assessment. Um, there is obviously um, the, the maxim caveat emptor that applies to any developer purchasing a site. I've looked at the respective uh, contamination inspection reports by surveyors on the two applications. And I can see very, very little difference. I, am, I understand that there are only six properties affected by, uh, as it were, undetected enhanced uh, contamination. Um, so effectively, if uh, and Mr. Bisley may be able to clarify this for me, there has been uh, underperformance, I'll put that in inverted commas, by a surveyor and that has not made the extent of the contamination clear in such a way that has clouded the negotiations and the land price offered by the developer initially. I would like, I would like to know that. I'd like to know how suddenly this additional, very expensive contamination allegedly 
that has brought us to today to revise the negotiation and revise the application uh, actually came about. I would, I really would like to know that because at the moment, I am genuinely undecided as to how to vote on this. Uh, I came here hoping today to be able to accept it. But from what I've heard, and I agree with many of the representations made today by different members uh, and different people addressing the committee, I am genuinely uh, unsure as to how I'm going to vote, even at this late stage. Thank you, um, Andrew. Mr. Bisley, uh, could you just tell us about this contamination report? Because I have also gathered that uh, when anybody buys a piece of land, they automatically do some form of, of investigation of the state of, of the condition of the land before they do anything with it. So perhaps you can clarify this for us. Yes, you one would expect uh, a developer or anybody else to undertake fair and reasonable due diligence prior to acquiring this site. Uh, one of the speakers early on um, has known this site for many years, and I think Hopkins have owned this site for, for many years before bringing it forward for development. Um, when the original application was submitted in 2017, um, no viability case was submitted seeking to vary the amount of affordable housing delivered at that point in time. It's only at the point at which they're about to commence development based upon that consent, which was it took some years to be determined, uh, that they then decided or realised perhaps the true out um, cost of development based on the income, and then that point decided to raise uh, submit a viability case. Um, as the members said there, there's been would have seemed to be no significant change really from the original 2007 until 2000 and um, uh, read the recent application really around the background to the site and risks attached to that. Um, it's not for me to comment why they didn't submit a viability case in 2007 and then chose to do one now. Um, it may be that there has been no significant change since 2007 until now, but all, all I can look at is will the evidence put before me at this point in time and assess it in accordance with um, the, you know, the guidance on how one looks at this. We, it's not for me to comment whether it's the rights and wrongs of government policy and guidance, but all I can do is you know, apply the rules, assess the information put before me and advise accordingly. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think that I think that's probably made up my mind. I think I'm, I'm going to uh, second Councillor Lloyd's proposal for refusal today, uh, and I do so with an extremely heavy heart for the people of Holt, with 49 people on the waiting list, and we're waving goodbye to 23 affordable homes. That's that is the sort of stuff that keeps a portfolio holder awake at night, and it's. It, it, I say it so with a, a very heavy heart, but I am going to be voting for refusal, Chair. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Councillor Withington. Thank you. I apologise for the croaky voice this morning. Um, I feel very much, therefore, for um, Councillor Brown with what he's just said. And I, I think the whole way this has come forward gives me the feeling on a personal level that we are almost being blackmailed in in some ways um, that's the feeling that it gives me because if we if we accept this we get the 23 affordable homes at public cost without the developer subsidy we are supporting and continuing this emphasis on Profit, profits for developers, which is we know is holding back affordable housing, and could not only across our district, but places like the Lake District, etc. As well, it's a national issue. Or we put ourselves at risk of further litigation, and also we lose that six hundred and sixty thousand pounds one hundred six that could have been used for even more affordable housing and I've heard the figures for Holt but I know from Councillor Frederick's work we've got 80 plus households not people households in temporary accommodation at the moment um, and something like 2,600 households on 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 waiting lists so it's a huge issue and it is a housing crisis and I would from my own personal viewpoint say that I am feeling that I'm almost being blackmailed in this situation and it's it's with a heavy heart 
that I'm having to think about my decision here. I think we should just take a deep breath before we do anything further, because we are talking about families who will be deprived of an affordable house. Um, and I can understand all your worries. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, um, but I do think very carefully. Um, yes, Officer Rouse. I'll and defer then, to Fiona and then speak oh, to Fiona. Yes, yeah, I, I think just under the, the legal terms of grant monies coming forward, I would just say that it's only available at, at, sort of annually. So if you do vote to refuse, you may be depriving the whole area of millions of pounds of gov central government grant funding, which is now available for you this April, which will not come forward again. And I, that's the only thing I would say, you know, have you a serious and significant ground for refusal for this to go to a potential appeal? Um, the phrase, a bird in the hand, it, it comes to mind. Thank you, Chairman. Um, as officers, we present a professional review of the matters and a recommendation. It is very clear that there are strong local concerns. Please do not consider for one moment that your officers don't share those concerns and that the officers that are speaking with you today do not work day in and day out for the delivery of affordable homes for our communities. We have to do that within the body and the framework of the legislation we're given and on the basis of the advice that is received by the officers who are making those recommendations. In this case, Chairman, there is a clear issue where this is a matter of planning balance. As we stand today, we have a situation where 23 homes can be built by flagship on this site with the assistance of commuted Section 106 money, flagship investment and government investment from the Housing Fund to deliver homes for local need in Holt on this site. And a degree of pragmatism officers believe is required in decision making here, having heard all that members have to say today. This scheme can deliver for local housing need. It will, if it is approved in accordance with the recommendation, be secured by a standalone agreement that will deliver 23 homes for those who are on that local waiting list. In addition to that, Chairman, there are infrastructure investments that will occur as a result of this development that may not occur or may be delayed if the development does not move forward. We're also in a situation, Chairman, where the developer will be put to task via an uplift clause. And if there is a profit to be made from this development that exceeds that, that our valuer has considered to be appropriate under the regulations, then those monies will be made available again for commuted sums to be invested in the delivery of affordable housing in Holt. The recommendation before you today, Chairman, is robust, solid and pragmatic. I understand all of the issues raised by this committee today, and in many ways I am personally sympathetic towards those. However, the recommendation is carefully drawn after much negotiation and can satisfy local need. Chairman, it will be for members in their voting today to consider whether or not they consider other material considerations outweigh that harm. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Councillor Blathery. Yes, it seems we're being asked to pay Dane Geld. And if you pay Dane Geld, you never get rid of the Dane. And this seems to be a precedent where we are being asked to make very, very difficult decision with a gun pointed at our head. And I'd like to know the size of the bore of the gun that's pointed at my head, in as much as if we, if this goes to appeal and we lose on appeal, do we lose the 16 homes as well? Thank you very much. 23 homes, I think it is actually. Um, Yes, Councillor Holliday, I'll allow you, to, because this is a very important position that we're taking with this, um, 
I'll uh, let you just come back very quickly, Victoria. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, it's an informal agreement with flagship at the moment, which concerns me, and especially especially in light of what the solicitor had just said in terms of the finances being time limited. Um, how long is this going to take to actually become a formal agreement? And will we still be at risk of losing that money if it dithers about? I think the agreement's being worked on at the moment. There's um, a meeting um, early next week to try and um, uh, bring that forward to fruition. Um, and all the agreements will sort of run parallel. The um, I think, as I understand it, um, there will be um, a, a contract um, for the uh, exchange with uh, between flagship and Hopkins Homes for flagship to purchase the property flagship will have um, a back to back agreement with Homes England to get the millions of pounds of central government grant funding, which is coming across to them. Um, flagship and North Norfolk District Council are entering into the funding agreement so that the money North Norfolk hold will go to flagship and flagship will give the covenants that the 23 properties will be forever um, held as affordable housing, shared equity, um, uh, you know, uh, um, with all the different tenures like that. So all the agreements will run and be entered into concurrently, as I understand it. And the time scale is two to three, possibly four weeks, but all of those will be formalized almost simultaneously. So they all have to be formalized together. So there will be the guarantee of the funding guarantee that the affordability will be secured on the property all at the same time. They won't go forward unless they are formally concluded. Question for my chair. What was the outcome if this agreement fails and is not, does not uh, get put into place? And what, 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 what happens then? Does Hopkins then have permission to carry on as it wants? Or does it have to come back to committee again? Uh, Chairman, we would still have a substantive application which would remain undetermined. We will not release this decision notice until that agreement is signed. Please be assured of that, members, if you support the recommendation today. If Hopkins pursue development at this site beyond a point whereby they should otherwise be delivering affordable homes under the existing planning mission that exists that they are effectively building on at the moment then that can be enforced by injunction under the rules of the section 106 agreement i would not expect hopkins to breach that in any way my expectation is that we will have this standalone agreement resolved i understand from our housing manager that these agreements are commonly used and that they are relatively simple to draw up that the developer is minded to agree that issue with flagship. So our expectation is that this will flow and that the agreement will happen and the, the homes under flagship can be delivered to satisfy local need. If that isn't the case, we will have a substantive planning application that will be returned to this planning committee. One of the speakers suggested three months. I suggest that may well be appropriate, Chairman. Thank you. Um, Councillor Pierce, you want to come back again quickly, please? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, it seems the more we discuss this, the more bullets are put into the gun, maybe of a smaller calibre or a larger calibre. This just, it just gets worse. Um, I'm at a loss because I am more angry at everything I hear because of the way this application has been put to us members. As I said earlier on, this is not politics. It's about trying to deliver some homes for a stretched authority that's got 2,500 people at least on a housing list and the amount of people that's in hope. And we're being told if we do this, we're going to lose this, we're going to lose this, we're going to lose this, lose this. This is about local need and local application to supplant that need. And I'll say it once more, I think this whole application stinks. Thank you for that very explicit um, presentation, Councillor Pierce. Uh, I now go back to Councillor Kershaw for its second bite at the cherry. Um, thank you, Chair. It's just I want to put on record that it's the 
the sterling work of our officers, particularly Nikki and, and Fiona Croxton, and who I trust, that will get this um, 23 houses that are needed. But it's with a heavy heart I will, I will vote to approve this because I think the need is greater. Um, but I have absolutely no respect for Hopkins hands. I think they're disgusting. I will propose to accept. Yeah. Now I'm going to go back. I think we're just about at the end of the discussion to uh, Councillor Fredericks to sum up, really. <laughs> Come on, Wendy. Well, there's a task. So <laughs> what we have um, in front of us is two guns pointing at our heads, actually. It's government. And it's also um, <laughs> the fact that we need desperately to have these affordable houses. Yes, it is. The funding is from the government and it will go back to the government if we can't spend it for local need. So in essence, we're getting 26 affordable housing for 1.4 million, which is, is pretty good in my book. However, I want to reiterate this isn't going to happen again. We are not going to be put in this position again. We are changing the checklist. So developers will not be able to do this to us again. It will not happen again. End of. So thank you very much. Concise and pre precise. Thank you, um, Wendy. Pardon? Yes, it is 23 houses. We've, we've gone from 17 to 26 to 23. But it is 23 houses. I can be hopeful. <laughs> so um, if you turn, please, to page 23, you will see the recommendation is for approval. I've had one proposer to accept the recommendation. Have I a seconder for this? Councillor Fisher seconds this. Um, and you'll see that there is a list of conditions, um, which I think are quite long. Uh, which is a draft list. Is, has it been approved at all? What conditions have been approved, have they? Yeah, they're draft at this stage. Um, as you can see, it's subject to, to changes by the assistant director. Um, but yeah, they've been drafted in full. Right, okay. So this is to uh, complete the, the deed of variation um, and to accept the application as stated. Um, I have the proposer, Councillor Kershaw, seconded by Councillor Fisher. Over to you. So this is for, against and differ. Abstain, Abstain. from the officer's recommendation, yes. Yeah. Councillor Brown? Against. Councillor Blathwaite? For. Councillor Fisher? Four. Councillor Grave Jones. Four. Councillor Heinrich. With great reluctance, four. Councillor Holiday. Ditto with great reluctance, four. Councillor Kershaw. Heavy heart, four. Councillor Lloyd. I'm against. Thanks. Councillor Mancini Boyle. Against. Councillor Pierce. Against. Councillor Taylor. Councillor Toy. I like to think we come here with a choice and we have no choice. So I'm going to abstain. Thank you. Councillor Varley. Uh, it's, it's with a very heavy heart for. And Councillor Withington. <sighs> Ext extremely disappointed for. That is nine votes for. Four goats against and one abstention. The vote is carried. Vote is carried. I think we all are feeling that somehow um, we've been shot in the in the foot with this one. So I think, as Wendy said, we have to make sure this is not allowed to happen again, and that the developers in future realise that when you uh, uh, accept uh, the fact that you are agreeing to build affordable housing you will have to build it so thank you very much for that and thank you for the members of the public who have attended <clears throat>
can I please ask you to come to uh, attention? As we now pass on to Chroma, um, <clears throat> PF. Oh, I've turned over the wrong pages here. What number page are we on, please, someone? 49. 49. Right. This is the CCT cameras. Um, and it's PF stroke 22 stroke 3028, page 49. And Officer Alice Walker is going to present. Alice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, members. Um, yes, this is the application for the installation and reinstallation of CCTV cameras and associated infrastructure around Cromer Town Centre. These are located at Cromer Town Council, 21 Overstrand Road and 13 other locations. Uh, the application has been brought to committee um, as lead member protocol could not be undertaken as Councillor Adams is both leader of the Town Council and ward member for Cromer. Um, the proposal seeks the reinstallation of eight CCTV cameras and the installation of three new cameras and three new antenna for transmission purposes in areas of public realm around Cromer Town Centre. The CCTV cameras will largely be placed on existing CCTV columns and streetlights with one new column proposed at Runton Road Car Park and the antennas will be located on three existing streetlights along the A149. Uh, this is a, oh, this next one. This uh, shows you an elevation of the proposed street lights. Um, I think they're approximately three to four meters above street level and higher on um, existing columns. Uh, this just runs through the locations of the um, existing columns and the proposed locations. These two are existing locations. Uh, cameras three and four is an existing location. The one at Meadow Car Park would be a new location. Just run through them. These again are existing locations. Uh, again, the camera nine at Meadow Road would be one of the new locations. The Runton Road car park location. And then these are the locations for the proposed antenna. Um, there are no, in terms of the key considerations, there are no significant concerns in terms of design and heritage impacts resulting from the proposal. In terms of amenity within the public realm, there have been instances of antisocial behaviour where the applicant feels they would have benefited from the use of CCTV. The council is also aware there have been recent incidents of vandalism and antisocial behaviour in the Cromer area, including destruction of council assets such as public toilets, which is detrimental to the community. Environmental health officers were consulted and considered that the proposed CCTV cameras should help discourage such activity, increasing public safety and better ensuring perpetrators can be brought to suitable justice. Um, therefore, um, the proposal is considered acceptable in terms of principle, design, highways and amenity, with public benefits identified from the refurbishment of existing CCTV poles, as well as safer public spaces. Uh, the recommendation um, is, a pr is approval of the application is therefore recommendation recommended subject to condition. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Alice. Um, now, I don't have any speakers for town or parish. Is this, this, no, we've had no public speakers. Uh, objecting? No, and no supporting. Tim, do you wish to speak to this one? Uh, very briefly, obviously, I, I suppose it's in, interesting because I'm also a local member. I know that I'm the applicant, but I'll try and speak just to the application briefly. Obviously, 11 cameras. We've been working on this for, for quite a time. We've been careful to put the locations of the antenna and cameras in locations that would avoid any tree works. Uh, that's been quite important. We want to avoid any uh, any any works that would uh, impact trees. Uh, it works on a light of, uh, sign of light of what am I talking about? I get my teeth in. Line of sight. Um, so it's it's a nano beam. And it's it's essentially a very similar uh, to a phone signal. So, but it's it's much narrower. Um, and you you just need to 
all the infrastructure needs to be able to see each other. We do have uh, the likelihood of a, a further application coming f later on because we are struggling to get line of sight on the existing infrastructure to run some road car park, uh, given some of the columns uh, that will need to be replaced there by the County Council. Um, but it's coming at a time, of course, when we have seen existing vandalism and social behaviour, but the cameras won't just be for that purpose. Uh, if you think missing persons, traffic, um, incident observation, event management, uh, monitoring of car parks. Um, but I did just want to respond briefly to the uh, privacy uh, concerns mm. that, that some uh, uh, members of the public had raised, and obviously we'd expected some of those. So the cameras will obviously just be monitoring um, and, and collecting footage in, in public realm areas, and we can block people's windows uh, using the software uh, where required. And, uh, you know, frankly, we won't actually have the resources to surveil individuals um, without any public interest in doing so. So it would be, you know, manned by a very small number of volunteers and even small number of, of staff at the town council. The only circumstances where such observation will occur is where we we've been asked to do so by the police or, you know, via RIPA um, uh, legislation, etc. So it, it would be very much planned and reactive work and wouldn't happen very frequently. Footage, of course, is not being kept for a long time. Operators are all going to be trained, vetted, um, and the operation as a whole registered with the information commissioner. So the system, of course, is owned, will be owned and operated by the town council using uh, some locations on district and county council uh, land, uh, but they will be accountable uh, for its operation. Thank you. Thank you. I know I did uh, mention this in our pre-meeting on Tuesday that uh, where these cameras have been removed in other areas because they were not effective. Um, they were asked to be kept also by the police. But I just like to put in here that if the police are keen to use these cameras, which are which are going to be paid for by Cromer, then perhaps they would like to put their hand in their pocket and come up with a little bit of money. Um, I'm going to have this is. But yes, thank you. Well, supporting you is not the same as putting your hand in your pocket. Oh, well, there, there we go. You see, this wasn't made clear. Fine. So supporting is has a financial element. Good. A few coppers. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. A few coppers. Oh, goodness sakes. Right. Can I open this up to the, to the floor now? Does anybody wish to speak on this one? Yes, John. Thank John you, Madam Chair. How do you follow that up? And then, um, no, actually, it was just about um, uh, just the story. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the proposal, and, and I'll be prepared to to uh, propose acceptance. Um, just disappointed that the consultee is, is of the police, um, and they have one line: that Norfolk Constabulary Constabulary is Constabulary is supportive of increasing surveillance with CCTV and Chroma. Doesn't really say a lot, does it? Give any reasons why it helps, or it, it, it was just one line and then pages of what the specification of the cameras should be. Um, so yes, I was disappointed in that from the police that they uh, could not be a bit more engaging if they're supportive of it. But uh, no, I'm happy to propose it. Thank you. Um, have I a seconder? Richard Kershaw seconding. Richard Kershaw seconding. Um, and anybody want to speak? Yes, Nigel. Nigel Pierce. Very quickly, uh, I think it's a good idea. The only thing is I draw a comment from one ex-chief constable of Manchester Police who said CCTV doesn't deter crime, it records it. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak on this one? Councillor Withington. Um, as a town who continued the CCTV when um, it was all, all stopped, I know it's been hugely beneficial for us at times and it's it's not necessarily catching someone doing something at the time on the CCTV, but it's for the police to be able to prove that someone was in the road next door at the time that it happened, etc. when they're saying, no, I was in Bodham, I was nowhere near Sheringham. Um, and it's often those kind of things that um, are the evidence that makes the difference. And um, And again, you know, we have an elderly population who you know we have higher numbers of people living with dementia and we do have people who wander and it's extremely helpful in those situations so um 
I can understand why Chromo want that reinstalled and to come back. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak on this one? No, no. Um, so there we go to the vote, please. Um, Councillor Brown? Four. Councillor Blathwaite? Four. Councillor Fisher? Four. Councillor Grove Jones? Four. Councillor Heinrich? Four. Councillor Holiday? Councillor Kershaw? Four. Councillor Lloyd? Four. Councillor Mancini Boyle? Four. Councillor Pierce? Councillor Taylor? Councillor Toy? Four. Councillor Varley? Four. And Councillor Withington? Four. That's 14 votes for it's unanimous. Thank you. So that's passed. Now it's five to eleven, um, and I'd ask that we have a ten-minute break just now because uh, I think the next presentation may be slightly uh, protracted. So, if you could please be back here by about five past eleven, and I think for the members, there's tea and coffee.
Oh, dear. Oh. Right. Welcome back, everybody. Refreshed, I hope. Uh, we now go to Chroma, page 55, uh, PF 2022 uh, 2051. Conversion of former bed and breakfast to seven flats. And we have Officer Stock to present. Thank you, Russell. Thank you, Madam Chair. So first of all, um, following the publication of the agenda, discussions between officers and the applicants planning agent have taken place. And, and as a result of these, um, it's been agreed to amend the description to conversion and renovation of building to create seven self-contained flats. And whilst the submitted floor plans and internal photos, it does appear that the building was last used as some form of bed and breakfast, insufficient information is available at the current time to confirm that this is the building's lawful use and the application has therefore been considered on that basis. With, spe with specific regards to parking, the Highway Authority have submitted further comments following this clarification of use, having considered the proposals against the worst case fallback position in parking terms, i.e. The, the, the building being a single dwelling, and they continue to raise no objection to the development proposed, whilst highlighting that the development could result in increased pressure on the limited on-street parking available. The close location of the site to the town centre and the availability of public transport connections are matters which would make it difficult to justify highways harm. And this approach is in line with the provisions of core strategy policy CT6, which allows normal, which allows normal standards of parking to be varied to reflect the accessibility of the site by non-car modes. For clarity, the existing floor plans which are on the screen now, um, show the building containing 18 bedrooms rather than uh, the 21, which has been quoted elsewhere within the agenda. Um, the existing floor plans, yeah, they're, they're there for you there. As the use has been clarified and the Highway Authority have now commented on the updated um, position, the recommendation can therefore be amended to remove reference to these matters. So I'll just read out the, the amended recommendation. So it's to approve planning permission subject to the imposition, imposition of conditions listed on pages 66 to 68 of the agenda and any other conditions considered necessary by the Assistant Director of Planning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Officer Stock. Um, <clears throat> now, we haven't got a town council speaker, officially, <laughs> but we do have an opposing speaker, Lindsay Lovett. Lindsay, if you'd like to come up, please. Yeah, thank you. Three minutes, Lindsay. Lovely. Thank you, everybody. I'm Lindsay Lovett, and I live um, next um, door to Leighton House at number 15. I'm speaking on behalf of my family. We've lived there for eight years, and some of the actual, like, sort of neighbours, like, sort of locally, who I all think have actually sent objection like letters as well. We're not uh, um, objecting to the build. We know that it should be done, but we think seven flats is a bit ex. ex excessive we believe that the road can't actually cope with that parking on the road is a nightmare and the lived experience of that is that it makes things very hard for people when I bring my 88 year old dad around when I pick up my son it's very hard to find any parking for lots of people on the roads it would mean an extra 7 to 14 extra cars just with those flats we believe an extra 21 bins and people always trying to find a space to park we think it should be either the um, two houses, which it was originally, or three or four flats. We think there should be like parking, like sorts of um, permits as well, which we've asked the council in like um, other times. We also refute the um, on the application that it's been used as a um, B and B recently. I've been there eight years. Um, we think it hasn't been used as a bed and breakfast for probably over thirty five years. I knew the lady who lived there um, before, and I think. She she's folklore in the actual um, like sort of um, 
in the actual like road the road has actually changed a lot since then there's lots more flats there's lots of businesses we have tourists coming in which is fantastic so we just don't think that that should be included and the highway should re um, think about that and then when the building happens how is it going to actually happen there's hardly any room for like maneuver how are the um, like workers going to get in and out there needs to be consideration around that for us who actually like actually like sort of um sort of actually like live there as we need to have some boundaries around how many hours are worked and the actual night noise levels that people um so we can actually still actually live there and work there and there are several businesses one right next to the other side which will be really affected um so we think perhaps you should consider closing the road while it's been actually done it should be done out of season and there needs to be an on-site night sort of manager which would, which links up with you guys and us guys as well so we welcome it but we are really concerned about it and there's lots of concerns in the road i think that's it oh thank you <laughs> if you'd like to go back thank to your you. we have one supporting speaker jordan crib like to come forward jordan please you have three minutes as well from the time you start speaking good morning madam chairman and members um the proposal before you today is for the conversion of a property on St Mary's Road into seven residential dwellings comprising of a mixture of one and two bedroom flats. Some of you may be aware of the property and the fact that it has fallen into significant disrepair over the years and requires significant care and attention to bring it a new lease of life. Internally, ceilings are falling down due to roof leaks, windows have been broken and every room requires significant attention to make it safe to enter, let alone... <laughs> The proposal represents the only viable option for bringing this property back to life at the standard it deserves. As the designers, we have ensured that as little alterations to the external fabric of the building are proposed as possible and the period features are retained. We are not proposing any alterations to the principal elevation which faces St Mary's Road and look to simply revitalise its frontage. Concerns have been raised over parking provision, which we understand um, for the residential dwellings. Importantly, the highways officer has no objection to this proposal. The occupants of these dwellings will be very fortunate not only to live in a beautifully refurbished period property, but also because of the extensive amenities that Chroma has to offer. Having a car is not a necessity given the central location of the property and its amenities being within walking distance from the property. The case officer has produced an extensive report for this agenda item of which they recommend approval and make some key points I would like to bring to the forefront. These include North Norfolk District Council cannot demonstrate a five year housing supply and this proposal falls in line with the requirements of the relevant policies. The site lies within the Cromer principal settlement. The proposal complies with various SS policies, um, which I won't read all of them. The residential dwellings all meet the, space, the required space standards for a one and two bedroom unit. The proposal conserves the distinct settlement character and special character and distinctiveness of the area. The materials would not rise, give rise to significant design concerns. There will be no impact on neighbour amenity and the principle of the proposal is considered acceptable. The applicant is determined to bring this former uh, this fantastic property back into use, ensuring it contributes to St Mary's Road rather than it being a blight on the street scene. We understand that residents are concerned with vehicle movements and parking, and the applicant has reassured me that they will consult with re residents throughout the construction process, updating them on activities and giving them contact details for the site manager in case any issues occur. We'd be happy to submit a constructive management plan to support this. Um, in terms of what the speaker has said, if I've got time, um, we're more than happy to, to have a condition about parking permits. Um, we the the concerns about working times and um, management of the site will all be covered through the construction management plan um, and we do want to work with people to make sure that this is a um is is not an issue for people that live around it um thank you for listening i hope members will agree with the officer's recommendation of approval given the public benefit of this application thank you thank you jordan for that to return to your seat um our local member, Tim Adams, will now speak. Thank you. Well, as you've heard, nobody is objecting to the principle of the development here. It needs to occur. Uh, it's a long term empty property that was in a poor state of pair, uh, repair for a number of years. And it is a beautiful, imposing building with a great deal of potential. 
Um, the concern of residents, which I share, is in respect of the scale of the development and our feeling that the number of flat, flats should be reduced to suit the context in which the property is set. Uh, it is, in effect, going from one dwelling to, to seven, and that is a scale which is out of proportion to its context. Um, we would wish to see a small number of flats. And we understand, of course, uh, about the previous and assumed uses serviced accommodation but as you've heard it hasn't been that way for 30 plus years and even then it's not what we would describe as bnb or guest house uh, accommodation now uh, highways do actually agree that there would be the potential for a significant impact arising from the development on parking and transport movements but both they and the authority are relying on the ct6 provisions which refers to exceptional circumstances impacts on the conservation area and developments in the town centre. Our view and the view of the town council, who I also speak for in some respects, is that it is not in the town centre and that the other provisions do not apply. It is certainly not in the economic or town centre or the primary shopping area defined within the authorities' policies, being around five minutes away on foot, and it's not situated in a location where general retail is occurring. If anything, uh, there, there may be an adverse impact on the conservation area as a result of approving such a development, uh, given the increase in, in parking and transport movements. So that provision surely doesn't apply either. Uh, I don't see that there are exceptional circumstances here that have been demonstrated. So I feel the provisions within the CT6 policy have been applied a little too loosely here. Uh, therefore, the parking impact of the proposal, in my view, does need consideration and only and the only way really to reduce that impact would be redu to reduce the quantum of uh, households pr proposed. Uh, the photos uh, taken, which you've seen, uh, I believe were taken earlier in the year. Uh, it's, it's much worse than that, actually, uh, in terms of the number of vehicles parked on the road between March and October. It's, it's, it's very much jam packed. So uh, the key issues that I feel are, are material considerations are, are the scale of the development proposed within the context and the transport impact, uh, which will impact on amenity. Uh, lastly, as you, you've already heard, if you are minded to give uh, any form of approval, either here or a later date or on an amended proposal, the impact of the development does need to be taken into consideration very carefully. Uh, impacts uh, around dust and noise could significantly impact the uh, existing B&B next door, which who, who are deeply concerned about the impacts on, on their business. They have their own parking, by the way. And secondly, the impacts uh, of, of things like plant skips and vehicles uh, on, on what is a heavily congested uh, road in terms of the parking already. So yes, a construction management plan uh, would, would certainly be required. Uh, that's that's all I wish to say. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, just point out that uh, this, this is number 11 and 13. So this is, there are two houses here, okay? And can I also just point out, having lived for many years in London, with parking permits, be careful what you ask for, because parking permits usually have to be paid for annually, and they do not guarantee you somewhere to live, but somewhere to park. Tim, they don't give you, you cannot guarantee a parking space. Yeah. I, I don't know whether some clarity may be useful here, but we, um, we had a big conversation about parking permits, um, I believe both 11 and seven years ago in, in, in Cromer, and it's the existing position of the County Council. They're only willing to provide a permit scheme uh, in Cromer on the basis of installing uh, pay and display meters um, throughout the town centre. So that's the reason why we, we've never been able to reach that uh, goal, which I believe um, roads like St Mary's Road, Central Road, Bernard Road, Alfred Road, to a lesser extent McDonald Road, um, and Meadow Close, which is a little bit more complicated. Um, residents in those loc locations do want to see those permits, but it's in terms of the resourcing of that, that the paid for permits itself won't pay for the enforcement. So that's the position of the parking partnership. Um, and that's why that's been so difficult to to really progress unfortunately yeah because pay and display um uh, um meters etc are very ugly and they take up space and such like and they're difficult to maintain um now i've got one speaker so far councillor pierce 
Thank you, Madam Chairman. It is an area that I know very well. And I do think that the flags lined up have been well presented by Tim and by the uh, speaker that sat eloquently over there. Uh, St Mary's Road is diabolical for parking. Let's not put it, let's not put it asunder. If we're all speaking from the same sheet as we are, parking is diabolical. It's a narrow street for a start. Parking both sides, and then maybe closure of the road. That's fine. So how do those residents get out unless it's just going to be closed for access? I know for well also that uh, paying for a parking space or a permit doesn't guarantee you that space. I have friends in London that pay £1,100 a year for a permit and park outside the house and they can never park there because somebody else has done it. Um, and we don't want that in Cromer. I understand, you know, we've got issues with the county council because of... Uh, Paying display meters or the dreaded parking meters. Cool. Well, where are you, Mr. Marples, when we need you? Um, but the simple situation is I would like to see this done. Um, it is a big conundrum. And I think if we're going to recommend to uh, for the director of planning to approve and put the conditions, is something that we've got to give the person you know, um, something that he or they can, through his team, administer to and understand the ramifications of it, because uh, I can see nothing but problems here, yet I do want it done. Uh, so I'm not being negative as I was with the other one. I think there possibly could be a way forward, but parking is going to be a problem. And don't tell me that if you live there, you're not going to want to park your car there, even though you live just outside side Cromer Town Centre. If you have a car, you're going to want to park it in the street. You're going to want to park it near your house. So there's going to be a problem. And uh, that isn't the only problem. Management, noise, pollution, time of working, it's all going to be put into consideration. And I think just cutting it down to six or five flats within that uh, two house accommodation probably isn't going to be enough. It's sure going to probably be, be too much, where in mind that most families now have two cars per house. It's a problem. So uh, maybe Philip has the answer, or we'll get the answer uh, if we can delegate it to him. But I am in favour of it, but there is an awful lot of problems. Uh, but to give it to the director of uh, planning to, yes, I am. But I think we've got to have, he's got to have very strong you know, parameters so that he can um, enforce those. Thank you. Philip, do you want to come back on this one? It, it may help members if I do. Um, if it doesn't, then my sincere apologies. Yeah. As we stand, the proposals are as they are. I, I, I don't have any powers to moderate those and reduce the numbers. You, you will vote today on the numbers that are on this application that are expressed in the description of development. I don't have any any powers as the assistant director of planning or the director of place, that's someone else, um, to make that decision. Um, I mean, certainly the, there are issues that have been raised about construction management plans. I hear that the applicant is minded to agree that a construction management plan could be imposed and that may alleviate some of the concerns from local residents. In terms of parking well the conditions are as laid out in front of you members if you wish to add further conditions we can advise on specifically what those conditions may be in law and how they can be enforceable but conditions certainly can mitigate but what I have to say chairman and I'm, I'm going to buy the t-shirt one of these days is you have in front of you members what is proposed I can't change that I regret only by you deferring and telling officers what what you may support could we go back but um you have what you have chairman so we will need to make a decision on that basis hopefully that helps the members thank you councillor holiday thank you ma'am um i agree with the parking issues but but what strikes me is the accessibility. I know that it says that three of the flats are going to be made accessible, presumably the three ground floor flats, but the other guys are going to be second floor walk-ups. 
I can tell you, I don't see a lift or anything like that. And that makes it very limited for people who might suddenly become less mobile. And I, I think it's, I think this is too cramped to go back to the drawing board and find room for a lift and uh, fewer flats. Thanks. Thank you. Want to say anything on this one? Um, well, but, uh... The request for a lift, I mean, there's no requirement, as I understand, under building regulations for a lift to be installed at a building of this height. Um, so the applicant, if, there's no building reg requirement to, to do that. Um, they provided a number of accessible flats, which accords with our policy. Um, so it's, it's policy compliance in that respect. It's like any, any building where, where there's multiple stories, you can't necessarily cater for every, every person. And, they've tried to accommodate that and they've met our policy requirements so they've got the numbers of that we're expecting of accessible units on the site um so that's why we're recommending approval of the scheme because we feel it complies with the relevant policy thank you um councillor Henry. thank you madam chairman uh, classic homes under the hammer development <laughs> uh yeah take a direct building maximize the uh, number of flats you can squeeze into it I don't have a problem with that. I mean, it, to, to me, looking at the drawings, it looks well designed and is maximising the internal space of the building. Whether that's too many, uh, I think, is a is a, is a is a judgment we may have to may have to make. But that old issue of viability creeps back in. Would four large, much larger flats be viable? Now, assuming these are going to be sold on. In, in some way and not, not run as, as uh, rentals. Parking is certainly an issue. Uh, and I think if we're going to go ahead of this, we need do need to start exploring the town council, the county, what sort of sensible permit parking can take place. And permit parking works in some areas, works, works very well in Winchester, I live there. It's a diabolical mess in Brighton, my brother lives. So it's good and bad with it much depends on the attitude of the highways authority and the local authorities i think my other big concern with this is you've got seven very nice airbnb lets there are these going to be flats available to local people or are they going to be money-making units for the, for the holiday industry <coughs> now if they're if they're if they're let as holiday lets we're going to get constant movement of traffic People who don't know the area are going to cause more parking chaos. We're going to get people who may not treat the area with respect. Is there any way we can restrict this use to purely residential and, and to prevent holiday lets? I'm happy to support it if we have that security that these are properties available to people to actually live in. Thank you. Um, Philip wants to speak and also go on, you go. I'm more than content to defer to our development manager, Mr. Lyon, but um, if further clarification or assistance is needed, please call. I mean, this issue is this issue of properties being rented out and not being people's main homes. It, it, I think it's starting to get national attention. The government are currently out of consultation on proposals for managing short term lets. Um, the planning system currently, if, if we were to grant permission, it would be for seven residential dwellings. Um, it's, as I'm aware at the minute, there's no mechanism we can impose to say that they have to be someone's first home or that we, 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 can we can restrict residential units so that they're for holiday lets or for those sort of purposes, but trying to impose it. And actually, how would you enforce making sure that someone's living in there that should it, it, it's, it's how do you make sure it's their only home or their first home that's that's, that's the hard bit for enforcement of, of, of conditions um i think we have to assess it on a basis that it could be used for those purposes and i think that's all we can you you, you can't control what you can't currently control i mean if government come come out with other requirements following the consultation and that may prevent people from doing what what we're concerned about but at the minute there's no mechanism i'm aware of that could secure what members are asking for here. Uh, thank you, Chairman. That's that's uh, kind of you. Um, the the law in itself at the moment is is 
grey, I, I think, to be kind. Um, we would have to be able to define a substantive materiality to the change in character that arises from the renting out of units as Airbnb or tourism accommodation. So um, the, the case law at the bar is pretty high on that. You're looking at a very intensive use that would change the character of one of these apartments. And that, that would be something which the case law at the moment is pretty challenging for enforcing authorities. However, as Jeff, uh, sorry, as Mr. Lyon has outlined for you members, the position is clear. The government are looking at this issue. I've just committed to one of our members that we will be responding to the government's consultation on short-term holiday lets. And we do believe that there is every likelihood that a planning consent may soon be required for the letting out of residential properties for, say, Airbnb or short-term holiday lets. And certainly as a council area, which has substantive business and substantive concerns about the letting out of properties, it is right that we respond to that matter. I spoke to the MP yesterday on those issues. So, Chairman, in short, um, it would have to be a pretty substantive material change to justify an enforcement action where these units weren't used as residential um, purpose. Um, and I need to make that very clear. If we're trying to impose a planning condition, then the planning condition for residential use would have to be set members against that pretty high bar that I've just spoken about. We would have to demonstrate that there was a material change in the nature of the way in which that building was being used. So at the moment, members, I'm sorry to say again this morning that the legislation is unhelpful for us in this area. And even if we were to impose a condition for residential use, then the enforcement of that condition, the bar that's set, would be pretty significant in terms of the height. Thank you, Chairman. Even if this, the, these are become Airbnbs, there are ways in which we can make sure that this, it is not, that these are not um, a nuisance in the street and to neighbours, because we do have environmental health. And environmental health can step in for noise. They can step in for mess, bins that are overflowing, et cetera, et cetera. So there's always ways in which we can actually uh, monitor this. But as Philip has said, if you've been reading your newspapers over the last week or two, the government is minded to bring in some form of legislation to make sure that if these Airbnbs are proliferating in an area, then they will need some form of planning consent to say that they are they are becoming a holiday let, not a residential. Yes, Liz, Liz Withington. I have tried to whisper to Tim, but um, I'm just wondering, because it's got a communal garden space at the back, and it's obviously in an area which is in close proximity to some very nice amenity space with North Lodge Park and the beach. Has it been considered whether that could be used as parking space? Because it seems to be parking, which is the huge issue here. And, and having regularly visited that road, um, I would be inclined to agree with that. I don't know. Um, does anybody know about this, Russell? Do you know if the if there is access to the rear garden from the from um, the road? Um. I know that the original proposals included um, some form of access off the street, um, which was raised as a concern by the Highway Authority. Um, I, 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 I can't tell you off the top of my head what that entailed and whether that was parking to the rear, but they, they did look at some form of on-site parking. But yeah, there, there were concerns from the Highway Authority on that. I think yep. if I could just answer that, I think that there, are, there would be even more concerns about impact on amenities. You've got the comings and goings of cars so close to someone else's neighbouring property that could cause even greater impact than the impacts concern about parking on streets. So you have to again, you have to be careful what you wish for if you're right. wanting rear parking. I mean, if you go into any town where you have roads of terraced housing, which was built at the turn of the 20th century 
um, and uh, people did not have cars. And so, you know, we're just going to have to live with it. If you live in a road, you move into a road where there are no parking spaces attached to your property, then you have to take that into consideration that you are going to have to park elsewhere or try and find a space on the road. And I will reiterate again, be careful what you wish for with regards to parking permits, etc. cetera. Um, now, I have a proposal to accept the recommendation as on page 66 from Councillor Pierce. Do I have a seconder for this one? <coughs> Are you going to second this? Yeah. No, right. Yep, you can speak, please. Uh, Councillor Kershaw. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to point out that we've heard from, from neighbours and we also, I think we all received a letter um, yesterday from other neighbours. Um, there doesn't seem to be an objection to the development of the property. It's just the scale of development. Um, and person, I mean, looking at the plans, four flats would seem to me a sensible potential compromise, which would probably lessen the use of um, Airbnb because there'd be larger flats, which would be more likely to be bought by people who lived in Chroma. Um, regarding parking, yes, we've got to be very careful what we wish for, but I'd just like to point out that NNDC has a very reasonable season ticket uh, for parking all year round. It's about £112 and it's not far from, from car park. So that is something that someone could take into account. And, and if there were seven developments there, I mean, with recent... Um, government um, unifications of, of waste collection, which I know has been pushed back to, uh, we could have seven bins per property. So seven properties with seven bins, you won't be able to park on the road for, for waste bins anyway. So we need to take that into account as well. Uh, we'll counter that to a certain extent. Sometimes with flats, they have big bins, not independent bins. Seven big bins then. Oh, <laughs> Richard. <laughs> Thank you for that. Anybody else wish to speak? Just a minute, Pete. Yes. Yeah. On, on the parking point, if, if obviously the pros, proposal before is for seven flats, so if we are talking uh, as an alternative scheme, obviously you'd have to either decide to refuse this this application before it is. On the parking point, going down to four flats doesn't necessarily resolve the parking point because if you're adding extra bedrooms, then you, that flat may require additional car parking spaces for that larger unit. So actually, given the floor area in effect, restricts the parking requirement or governs the parking requirement you've still got the same floor area you've probably still got the same parking requirements so it's i wasn't arguing the parking i was arguing that the, the probably less use of airbnb with the large flats would okay not the parking but yeah just just for clarity in terms of going going to a smaller site doesn't necessarily resolve the parking point peter thank you madam jeff, jeff has just made the point that I was going to make that uh, there would be more bedrooms likely and therefore slightly diff different demographic and you may well get the same number of cars and and St Mary's Road if it was a, a, a single dwelling adding three or four cars to St Mary's Road would absolutely stow it up anyway so it, there's not going to be room for people to have two cars each in, the, in St Mary's Road whatever the outcome of this application. Okay. Thank you. Um, Councillor Toy. I'll try and be brief, Madam Chair. Uh, like you, I've lived in London for times. And, and if you if you want to own a car when there's a public transport system nearby, then that's one of the consequences of living in a town, I'm afraid. Uh, whilst I have every sympathy for neighbours that this would increase that, there is alternatives pointed out with the parking opportunities. And actually, you know, um, yeah, there is a debate around the number, but seven would potentially, whilst it potentially could be Airbnb, actually gives potentially for people to, to get on the ladder with a one bedroom flat, who will then be hopefully encouraged to use public transport because, uh, as you know, a council that stood on the green agenda, then we need to discourage the use of cars and not encourage it or finding space for them. So um, I'm happy to second. You're second. Thank you, John. Anybody else wish to speak? Adam, yes. And then um, you wish to sum up, Tim, afterwards? Adam. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I know there's been a few concerns over the commencement of building works if we are minded <coughs> to process this application. Um, can we condition a works management scheme? Would that would that be possible to, to highlight any um, risks which might incur during the building works? 
Russell's coming to answer that one for you. Yeah, I think I think we could uh, construction management plan of some sorts we could initiate, and, and and the applicants plan agent um, spoke earlier and said they'd be broadly supportive of that. So that could be something that delegated authority to agree. Is that yeah. all right, Jordan? Well, I, I think bearing that in mind, John beat me to it, but I would be more than happy to yes. um, support this application. Thank you. Tim, you're going to summarise for us, please. Uh, yeah, first of all, just um, just a point of clarity uh, around the rear, uh, the road to the rear, which uh, you might describe as an alleyway, but it, 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 it is, uh, a, I believe the highways authority call it a V-class road. So it's very uh, narrow road. And the reason they um, they didn't like the access along there was for that reason. There were also concerns from residents about the levels between uh, the, the, the road and the rear garden being uh, very much different so um it would be you know quite a considerable ramp etc to, to to achieve that not that i'm saying it's necessarily impossible but you know that there might have been some 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 neighbor concerns as well as a result of that um just to sort of clarify as well on on the point of nearby parking provision the nearest car park is actually a short stay car park it's full during the summer the nearest long stay is Cadogan road that's also full during the summer so actually the nearest car parking provision pay and display as Renton Road generally during the summertime, which is quite some considerable distance away, I'm afraid. Um, so uh, yeah, it, the, the point really remains about um, the scale of the development and whether the impacts uh, on, on amenity and parking uh, can be in any way reduced. Um, and you know, my, my feelings are again, that I feel the only way of doing that is reducing the quantum of, of flats um, proposed. Um, thank you, Adam and, and others again for highlighting the uh, issues with, with construction uh, management. So whatever happens here, please um, do, do bear that in mind uh, because it's a, a very important point. Thank you. Thank you. I think just point out, as Peter had said, that even if you reduce the number of flats and you increase the number of bedrooms, you could get two or three young people in there who want who all want a car so you're actually not reducing the numbers of vehicles as such um, and as John said if you live in a town in the middle of a town where there is public transport etc and you want to pay you want to have a car well then you're going to have to pay for it because this is what we had to do in London it's difficult as I said terraced housing does not have normally garage facility by the side of it so we have to take that on board now the have we all finished speaking now is everybody okay so we have a proposer uh council appears to accept the recommendation as set out on page 66 with the inclusion of um a, an extra condition for a construction management plan to be put in place um, and this has been seconded by Councillor Toy, and we now go to the vote. So there's, you've got the list of, of, of reasons there for conditions, etc. Lauren, can we have the vote, please? Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Brown? Four. Councillor Bluffwaite? Four. Councillor Fisher? Four. Councillor Grave-Jones? Four. Councillor Heinrich? Four. Councillor Holliday? Councillor Kershaw? Four. Councillor Lloyd? Councillor Mancini Boyle? Four. Councillor Pierce? Four. Councillor Taylor? Four. Councillor Toy? Four. Councillor Varley? And Councillor Wivington? Four. That's 13 votes for, one against the vote is carried. Mrs. Kerry, thank you very much. Um, does anybody want to pop off? And I think there were two members who would like to go before the next one. I do apologise, Madam Chairman, but I have an appointment at 12. Yeah, well, fair enough. If you slip out now before we go on to the tree preservation orders. I don't know why people.
Can we go on, please? Now we have page 69. Order. Now. Shall I give you a bash with the old gavel? You naughty boy, Richard. Right, now we've got the TPO stroke 220997, which is the land rear of the poplars, Chroma. And we have our uh, landscape officer, tree officer, image and mole will present this one, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so this proposed tree preservation order um, was served on one individual lime tree. Um, and it's shown there just north of the previous application that we've discussed um, to the south of properties on Vicarage Road. Um, so a bit of background on this property. It was subdivided from a single dwelling into flats in 2003 and a planning condition of the conversion to flats was placed on um, the decision to retain the tree. Um, and we can see just a bit of context. It's within the town, very urban area, not much greenery around. Um, and there's a picture of the alleyway, the loke towards the properties and a picture of the pollarded lime tree there and the parking area that is being currently used by the flat owners there at the Vicarage Road property. So um, it is very close to the wall and there is some root damage as vehicles have been passing over the top of the tree roots. Um, and um, the area is currently being used for car parking. Thank you. And there's a picture supplied by the residents showing um, the difficulties. So um, the residents had applied to remove the tree um, to allow um, easier parking in the area that was provided. Um, and um, issues around cars being slightly bigger these days and um, it is just tricky you know you can see it's quite tight in that place but um, you know historically only two of the three flats have had that car parking provision for them so um, by removing the tree and a small section of the wall it would certainly make it easier for those residents to get in and out. Um, so we reviewed the tree and um, the tree's still in good condition um, it still contributes positively to that um, area of Chroma um, retaining the tree and, and continuing its um, protection will obviously conserve the um, amenity of that land um, and the, the tree in my view is still a good quality tree and, and should be retained so um, that's the, the background and, and the reasons why um, we are recommending that this order is confirmed today. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody want to speak on this one? Good heavens, Gerard, yes. I've been quiet at all. You now. have, I don't know. Must be something about... Quite a, quite a morning, really. Um, <laughs> first of all, I love TPOs. Um, looking at that, I really don't see the problem with the access. If it was right in the middle of the access, then I probably would say, well, I knew. And then the tree was there first anyway. So keep the tree. Tough luck. Get on with it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, and I'll... Um, so you're proposing acceptance. Right, Harry, you want to speak? Um, I would like to second. Um, I would uh, refer to the uh, wine glass theory on trees, and I'm worried about protection of those roots. Is uh, uh, something we can instigate to make sure those roots are fully protected? Uh, because at the moment they're getting crushed, and as we know, with the wine glass, it will fall. If it if it can, that damage continues, so um, I would definitely like to second this, uh, but also uh, in, in, go one step further and protect those roots. Thank you. Thank you, Imogen. Is it is it possible to do that? Um, certainly, we can provide information and support to the residents about um, surfacing and, and protection, and, and it is doable. Um, there's always a way to do it, um, and yeah, that would give us the impetus with the order in place to say, okay, well, now the tree is formally protected, we can give you some more advice about how to prevent any damage occurring. Thank you. Um, 
Adam, you want to speak? Uh, yeah. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, although this discussion is being quite um, thought provoking so far, we are jumping the gun in process. We haven't gone to the um, local member as of yet. <laughs> Who is the local? Tim. Yeah, yeah I'd like to come in if you want. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It sure. doesn't matter when, because with this, we don't Sorry? follow the same protocol as we yes, do. Right. Okay. okay. I, I was just you concerned know. that we might be jumping the gun, Madam Chairman. Thank you. you. <laughs> Look, he's putting me in my face. I shall have to have a word with you afterwards, Adam. Tim. Sorry, I was also under the assumption. I, yeah. Okay. Fair enough. You cleared that up. Um, well, okay. You, you've heard for the second time, really, about parking pressures on the road, but I do hear. Uh, I, I do agree with with the officer assessment. We, we've seen actually a lot of the trees removed in that area, immediate area of uh, St Mary's Vicarage uh, Road and the Loke over the past 10 years. And that's been had a negative impact on, on the immunity of the street uh, scene um, in that in that time period as as people do remove trees. So um, it's, it's important this one is, is protected. It's certainly, um, you know, the, the rear alleyways of both St Mary's and Vicarage Road uh, are, are broken up by the the the, the, the presence of trees, so the, it, it's it's valuable. There should be more of them, not less of them, really. So um, yes, I, I welcome this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I did actually. It's my fault. Uh, this this one, I should have said that there were no uh, opposers or proposers for this. So um, objectors and supporting speakers. And sorry, Tim, you should have spoken, but you've spoken anyway, so. And Adam was right, I have to say. I'm just going to have to deal with you later. <laughs> so anybody else? Oh, John wants to speak. Yeah, briefly, Madam Chair. Um, it's not, I guess, something that we could give out as um, a suggested advice to go with the protection of the land. But I noticed in the images supplied in the pack, there's a vehicle parked in forwards. Mm. and. A highway code, 201, says when using a driveway, reverse in and drive out if you can. And I'm concerned that they are reversing out of there with the tree blocking their view. And actually, they should be reversing in and they would get the vehicles in easier and around the routes. Well, That's I think all. thank you. we have to take the view that obviously yes. the, the, the photograph of the cars being uh, parking are perhaps just done for our benefit. Of course, but but I'm just saying that, that by using that principle, it would help to protect the routes, which is one of the things that yeah. we're, we're concerned with. The vehicle manoeuvring inwards by re reverse could move manoeuvre yeah. around the routes better. Well, got that out, thank you. Got it out in the end, didn't you? That's good. There were also two bins on the other side of the tree. If the bins had been put by the side of the tree rather than opposite the tree, it would easily well, enter. It's what I said, isn't it? You, you, you take a photograph, don't you, to highlight how you feel about things. Thank you, Richard. Anybody else wish to speak on this? Victoria. Just going back to the protection of the roots, Imogen, um, would it be possible to do something physical to actually protect them in the way of a barrier or a, a, to actually, rather than just advice and guidance, which might not always be followed? Um, a barrier type um, membrane or um, grass grid or some sort of stabilizing structure for the gravel over the top of the roots would be something that we would, um, you know, advise on as an appropriate solution. You could have bonded gravel and we'd want to see something permeable, um, although it is happening and it is causing a damage to the tree, we can't make people implement some particular thing um, but we can certainly look at how we can nudge that good behavior if you like presumably if the tree had to be removed because of the damage we could put a condition in to say that they have to replace exactly yeah which yeah. i think we need to take into consideration here which we've done before so if they start to make sure that the tree doesn't survive then we're going to turn around and say <coughs> Well, actually, you're going to have to put something else there instead, another tree. Not necessarily in the same spot, but they have to replace. Right. So um, can we put that in as a condition or is that just something? No, it's not really a condition, is it? No. So we're going to the vote. We have uh, Gerard mancini Ball is proposer, seconder Harry Blathwaite. This is to accept the recommendation as... Uh, printed on page 71, that the order be confirmed with modifications. Could we have the roll call, please? Lauren? 
Councillor Brown? Four. Councillor Blathwaite? Four. Councillor Fisher? Four. Councillor Grove Jones? Four. Councillor Heinrich? Four. Councillor Holiday? Councillor Kershaw? Four. Councillor Lloyd? Four. Councillor Marcini Boyle? Four. Councillor Toy? Four. Councillor Varley? Four. And Councillor Withington? That's unanimous 12 votes for. Very good. Now we go to Sheringham TPO 220996. Um, that's on page 73. Uh, we have no town parish objector supporter, but we do have the local member, uh, Liz so, Whittington. Liz. Sorry, Chairman. Um, the case officer needs to present their report first. Oh, of course we do. Well, Imogen, you know, it's getting near lunchtime. Isn't it? <laughs> Thank you, Madam Sorry, Chair. Sorry. Ah, yeah. oh, dear. <laughs> off we go. Okay. So um, this is to um, uh, consider a tea, another tree preservation order, a woodland order in this instance. Um, the land is situated to the rear of some properties at Hooks Hill um, Road in Sheringham. Um, where there's a bit of planning history, so I'll run through that. Um, it's connected to a wider woodland area, um, a natural area on Franklin Hill and a larger TPO area you can see there in green um, with the um, hash uh, over the top of it there. Um, so what I'm proposing is a modified um, order. Uh, there was a slight administrative error when we served the order, which cut across some of the planning application areas. And I can see that that is one of our errors. So serving it as modified, um, just a slight line change of where that woodland area is, is what we're proposing today. Um, so the woodland is situated um, within the town, um, just south of Weybourne, Cromer Road and um, east of Holway Road, sorry, west of Holway Road. Um, and here you can see on the first OS map um, in 1801, um, the topography of the land, um, you know, is um, natural, that Hooks Hill, you know, as a hill, it's quite difficult to cultivate. Um, historically, there wouldn't have been housing there. And there on the RAF maps, there's an unhelpful cloud um, covering the uh, area, but there is a um, natural area shown underneath there too, um, with Abbey Road, I think it is just coming down in that white um, area. Um, so the plot is um, quite a large um, dwelling. Um, in the 70s there was a house, um, it was subdivided um, and you can see um, there on the 1970s application. Um, then an infill plot was received in 2021 um, which is built and you can see the house there. Um, and then the next application which um, sub, it was to demolish that dwelling and then subdivide it into two further properties. And then what instigated this tree preservation order is this um, final application where the red line is set further back um, up into the woodland area. Um, and it's at that point that we served the order. Um, and you can see there the um, arboricultural impact assessment um, survey where circles are indicating canopies of trees and it's very busy. Um, and uh, there's our DEFRA um, map, the forest inventory showing that whole area as woodland. Um, so here's a couple of site pictures where um, I'm on ground level there looking up into the woodland area and you can see quite a significant level change. Um, and um, from the woodland area looking down onto the street again, it's very narrow between the dwellings, although that one is proposed to be um, demolished on the right and um, I've taken some pictures inside the woodland area there's um, an attempt to make um, the dwelling in a natural sort of clearing of the area but it's treed um, you know you can see that uh, uh, diverse um, species a uh, diverse um, age range um, uh, woodland flora on the ground um, and it would have meant um, you know even repositioning the dwelling into you know all sorts of different ways we thought and talked over on site, you know, some tree impact would happen. Um, the services would have been extremely tricky to connect into the infrastructure. 
and um, looking out, um, the resident was sort of keen to have that view of the coast and, and the sea and, and Beast and Bump, which would have all had additional impacts on those retained trees, not least the fear of trees falling on a new dwelling or um, branch drop, leaf fall, on it goes. Um, and, and there's some more pictures in, in the woodland itself. Um, there was no protection on the trees. Um, the residents or the, the applicant had not uh, felled any trees. They were being very, um, you know, engaged with us in, in terms of negotiation on the plot. So I want to point that out now. They've, um, you know, been very keen on um, working with us, but it's my understanding now that that final application has been withdrawn from the planning um, process. Um, so the, the modified order, um, as recommended, will accurately represent which area we are referring to. Um, the woodland would have formal per se protected status um, in line with the woodland to the south and the Franklin Hill open area, although not protected, is a public asset um, and it connects that biodiversity and um, amenity. It's sort of thinking about it in a much broader sense of um, habitat connectivity. Um, and in our view, it's important to retain. So um, we are recommending that the modified order is confirmed today. Thank you. I'll say again, no town and parish, no objector, no supporter, but we do have our local member, Liz, Liz Withington. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Imogen, for that um, good introduction. I think there's only two points I, I want to raise um, in terms of this. I can't stress strongly enough how um, important the town feel it is to maintain those habitat corridors. And if you look on the um, aerial photographs, I think actually the smaller scale one shows it more significantly um, what an important role that plays in connecting up the triple SSI down by the commons and, and up through to Pretty Corner as part of the um, habitat corridors for the town. And it's actually part of the town plan um, under the town council for habitat corridors to be um, encouraged and maintained. So I know the town feel quite strongly about that. In addition, those of you who've driven along the Weybourne Road towards Sheringham will notice that just to the west of this site, another development on Hooks Hill has gone up into that tree canopy. And it is like a scar on, on that lovely green entrance to Sheringham. So, um, I think it, it's really important that that isn't allowed to develop anymore because it is very much, we are Twix, Sea and Pine with Sheringham, that is our, our phrase. And that right hand side up by um, Franklin's Hill and Hook's Hill is very much that definition of the Twix, Sea and Pine. So from an aesthetic point of view as well, it would be a great shame to use that strong image as you enter from the um, western side into Sheringham. So those are the only two points that I want to raise, but, um, you know, are very supportive of this being included and mod as a modified TPO. Thank you, Liz. Richard, do you want to say something? <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd just like to, to commend Imogen for a, a very thorough and uh, considered report, and I'm more than happy to propose confirmation of this. TPO, thank you. Uh, uh, you know how I feel, all the, tw all the 12 or 13 years I've been doing this now. Um, we have the least forested land in Europe. We have cut down and cut down and cut down. I actually saw a comment by someone, not necessarily on this, saying that they, they'd moved into North Norfolk and they were very upset because the trees were dropping their leaves and they were going to have to sweep them up and get rid of them. You know, so I think we're just going to have to take the fact that there are people who just do not like trees. Well, that's just tough, isn't it? That's tough. We're in a rural area and we have lots of beautiful trees. And they are our lungs. They're the lungs of, of our cities, etc. So I've had my little rant. 
Has anybody else wished to speak on this? Gerard, come on then. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm a bit of a tree hugger at the moment, aren't I? Um, I noticed on one of the slides that um, Lauren pulled up that there's quite a lot of young um, sea scouts and all this type of thing in, in, in the area. Well, sh surely th 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 this, is, this is an ideal place for them to go and see nature f firsthand. And, you know, it, it's, it's, in, it's, it's in the residents' interest for their well-being. Mm -hmm. I mean, you might not be all being washed down for a couple of houses, you know? Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous. We should be keeping these things. You know, I'm always going to vote for them, Pauline. You know I will. I know. Thank you. I think we've been lax in the past uh, about preserving our green spaces, but hopefully we've, we've got that tucked away now. And we've got such as Imogen and North Norfolk District Council who are quite happy to support green spaces. Did you want to say anything, Philip, or are you just gazing in awe? Right. Sheer all, Chairman, as ever. <laughs> right. Does anybody else wish to speak on this one? No? So we'll now go to the vote. This proposal is Councillor Kershaw to accept the recommendation that this order be confirmed with modification uh, and seconded by John Toy. The, the um, order recommendation is on page 75. Could we have the list, please, Lauren? Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Brown? Councillor Blathwaite. Four. Councillor Fisher. Four. Councillor Grave Jones. Four. Councillor Heinrich. Four. Councillor Holiday. Councillor Kershaw. Four. Councillor Lloyd. Councillor Mancini Boyle. Four. Councillor Toy. Four. Councillor Varley. Four. And Councillor Withington. Four. That's 12 votes for. That's unanimous. That's been pro pro um, passed. Thank you, Imogen, for that. Thank you for coming and speaking to us. It's your first time, isn't it? Second. Okay. Right, we're moving swiftly on to Jeff here um, with his performance update. <laughs> I'll, I'll re rephrase it, management performance update. Okay, thank, thank you, Chair. So on page 77, I've set out the performance for the Development Management Service for the month of March this year. So there's a table there setting out the number of decisions we've had. So we've had five major decisions issued in March, all of which were issued within time, and 76 non-major decisions, and over 97% of those were issued within um, time. So in terms of our 24 month batting average um, for majors we're uh, in well in excess of 96% now and for non-majors uh, over 87%. So uh, our, our performances of DM services is sort of in the upper quartile of uh, nationally now. So, um, yeah. okay. Thank you. Uh, now, Fiona, over to you, my love. We can get more and more of these happening. It's, um, We've actually, it's not eight, we've got six um, outstanding and um, we've just agreed the one for the cattle shed, which is um, was just um, uh, a long history of a couple of permissions um, superseding each other. So the um, applicants there have entered into uh, or entering into a unilateral undertaking that they won't carry out certain developments. That's all. They've agreed that now. And so they're going to be signing that. Um, and otherwise, uh, yes, still waiting on the Chris Malting one. Um, that that draft section 106 rune was um, circulating last November. So I chase at least once a week, if not twice, for that response on that one clause, which is outstanding. Well, that's the traffic regulation. Yes. Yeah. You want to say something on this, Andrew? Yes, please, Chair. Um, I, I wonder if it is within our gift to make a recommendation that we put um, a stop date, as it were, on the negotiation period for the Chris Martins one of, say, to allow for um, the, the PERDA period that we're in at the moment. If, if we were to say we want uh, this to be signed by, say, the 30th of June, end of June, and if not, we'll bring it back to committee. Yeah. Is yeah. that... Exactly. Is that possible? Can we do that? Yeah, I mean, as I'm the case of the application, there's a couple of things in addition to the 106 we're still resolving. So there was a point with Natural England that we are in the process of resolving over habitats, regs, and neutrality. 
Um, the conditions list is 99.5% done as a final agreement on list of plans, which says it's a relatively simple task. So once those issues are resolved, then yes, we'll, the only outstanding issue will be the section 106 obligation. And I think we need to get that point uh, resolved quickly. And I'm happy to bring it back if we don't get success um, soon. So it, can you put a, a date on it? That's what I think Andrew's asking, and Fiona also was asking us. Well, we, we can... If they don't in, sign a the, thing, then we would bring it back to... Yeah, so in, in the recommendations of the committee, there was a clause in there that said if we don't, if prog sufficient progress isn't being made, we can bring the matter back to the development committee. So there's a committee saying to me, we want this resolved by the end of June. Mm. If we don't have it resolved, it will come back to committee in July or what the earliest date we can do after that point. What does the committee feel about this? Andrew, you want to say something? Yeah, yeah. Well, right, I, I, yeah, I, I would uh, make a proposal in those terms, Chair. I mean, yeah. you know, I think the issues in, in the Section 106 agreement, as I understand them, fairly straightforward. I mean, it, you know, if there is a traffic regulation order required, we're not saying, you know, that, that they have to wait until that order is as it were, signed off. Goodness me, we'd be waiting forever if that was the case, well, look given my is. experience of the performance of the County Council in that regard. But um, but surely we, we can make it clear that we need to, to see progress with the Section 106, not, notwithstanding other issues that remain to be resolved. So Fiona can pass that on and Jeff can pass that on. I think we do need to tie them down to this one because it's really begin. I mean, this has been going on for God knows how many years. Um, and we, uh, you know, with you see what happens if you don't tie people down, they just prevaricate and it goes on and on. So June, July, June made a bit early actually because of the new structure. I mean, obviously, the matter is, is delegated to the assistant directors, so it's it's the assistant directors' call ultimately as to where it comes back. But obviously, we've had the discussion today. Um, officers are doing all they can to progress this. Uh, so if we don't get that resolved, then we'll, we'll, we'll bring that back to committee for reconsideration. Uh, we, we can't have these things open-ended forever and a day. There has to come a point where if, if things aren't signed, you bring it back for resolution. Philip. Uh, July the 20th is the provisional date, Chairman. Yeah. Um, I'll keep an eye on those issues. I understand the point raised by Councillor Brown. I feel it's entirely appropriate when members delegate authority to complete section 106 that you are updated as you are by this report. And it's right in this section of the committee debate that, that the members confirm when they would like that issue to be returned back to them for reconsideration. So uh, I've got that on my workload and I'll look at the 20th of July and we'll keep you updated through the briefing sessions in the interim. Thank Is that you. okay, everybody? Sounds sensible, doesn't it? From what's gone on before. Okay, Fiona? That, that's you... that's helpful, thank you, because the, the wording's there. It's just, they won't sign it. <laughs> so thank you. Um, and nothing else to report on on that. As I say, the, the, the cattle shed one is um, going through. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Fiona, because these are difficult. And, um, you know, people like to wiggle out of things if they can. Ever made me say that? Um, right. Now, on to the appeals section, please. Jeff? Sorry, Sorry, there's not a huge amount to report in terms of new appeal decisions. Um, we are still awaiting the big decision at CLI, so I think that's moved. We were told, I think, end of March, beginning of April, and I think, um, I don't think that was confirmed, but yeah, I don't know which year that was, but yeah. I mean, obviously it, we'll It's the end of April, Jeff. That's what the planning inspectorate have offered. I believe they've been in touch with interested parties, offered apologies, and they tell us that it will be issued no later than the end of April. We will keep the committee updated and obviously speak with the interested parties. We have had one decision come in, and that is the case um, on page 84, top of page 84, the application at Swayfield uh, for, for a single dwelling that was dismissed by the by the planning okay. director. So that's um, one's gone gone in our favour. Uh, and the list uh, with at, at the end I've reported them at the last committee, but you know our record again is pretty good on decisions. There's three appeals that have been dismissed. We did lose one case, uh, which is an enforcement case uh, at LB with Thwaites. Um I don't know if Philip you wanted to say anything on that particular point. 
uh, through you, um, Sport mm -hmm. Chairman. Uh, very disappointing decision, this. Um, officers took technical advice before issuing the notice. The technical advice that was taken and the details of the notice were disagreed by the inspector and the enforcement notice was quashed. It was a disappointing outcome. Lessons to be learned, we'll work those through with East Law with support mm -hmm. from Fiona and our enforcement team, but I can confirm for you, Chairman, that the enforcement team have mended the enforcement notice and are looking to reserve a new notice with support from East Law. Fiona, I think it's coming to you shortly. And the expectation is that this notice will be reissued. The contravener, Mr. Barrett, is aware of this, I believe, as well. So we should be moving back to the notice being mandated and reserved. Frustrating, Chairman. Thank you. Anybody, anybody, anything to say, Peter? Which one is this that you're? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Just an apology to Jeff. Really, I sent him an email that made no sense whatsoever on Saturday. And my only excuse was that I was drinking non-alcoholic lager, sat having lunch at the rugby club at the time. So I apologise for that. However, it was about um, enforcement notice 210061, which has been on the books here for, for a very long while. That pizza van has now moved to an even worse place. And I've spoken to Kevin Peacock and he isn't taking enforcement on it. And it's uh, far more controversial and, and <laughs> couldn't be a worse place to put it. But uh, however, we start again, no doubt. Which one is that, Peter? Yeah. On page 84, 2100613 three up from the bottom. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. Well, it's nice to see. Thank you. You were drinking non-alcoholic lager. Now, now I have been with you to these do's at the rugby club, and um, I've never seen lager served in two pint jugs before. You know, it was going down. But, no, I believe every word you said, Peter. Uh, uh, it was, and they had to send out for it. There was none in the building. None in the building? No. Well, there we go. What can we say? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> we go to section 15, exclusion of present. Oh, sorry, um, Liz. That's all right. Apologies, dear. I'm hiding behind Mr. Barney. Um, it's about the East Beckham one on page 82. Um, it's an enforcement one, 220289. Um, I was just wondering, have we got a stop notice on that one at this present time? Which one is it, sir? The East Beckham case, the second one down from the written rips, appeals in hand. Um, I don't know, I don't know if uh, Philip's got, saying he's got more knowledge on that one, so I'll pass over to Philip. Uh, our enforcement service have served an enforcement notice, Chairman. If there's a reason from wider public amenity or safety that the ward member would not like to make us aware of, then we will consider those issues and we may consider serving prefer the stop notice. The appeal is against the enforcement notice. Yeah. It is simply an enforcement notice alone. But if there are wider issues relating to safety or amenity, then obviously we'll be happy to review those with the ward member. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And who else? John, you want to say something? Yeah, I, I, before you, you close the meeting off this, Madam Chair, I just wondered if there was anything significant um, in terms of nutrient neutrality or, or whether we're just where we've been briefed before and what's on the website. Um, just I was specifically asked at a parish council meeting last night. So. Um, there's not there's not a huge amount to report in terms of availability of credits. The Natural England um, mitigation scheme is is still some way from having credits available to sell. There's quite a lot of been work being done, and Philip's been involved in that to do with the joint venture. Um, so. Well, if Philip wants to say anything on, joint, on the joint venture, he's been, been involved in it quite yeah, extensively. Of course. I, I, Jeff is speaking as our development manager. I'm wearing my other hat um, as now a board member of the joint venture, and I can tell you that we have our share certificate in the joint venture as North Norfolk. So we are um, fully joined up with the business and we are part of Norfolk Environmental Credits. At the end of this month, the Environmental Credits Company will launch a web page. The web pages will have the opportunity for interested individuals to apply for applications 
to um, deliver credits in partnership with the joint venture. So we'll be working with our landowners and those who are able to look at a credit modeling process, which will bring forward mitigation. We are also looking at a public meeting, which will be held in May or early June, where we will update more broadly. I met with the Country Landowners Association earlier this yeah. week, and there is a commitment for the Country Landowners Association to attend that meeting and to work with their members to help deliver nutrient neutrality across Norfolk and particularly in North Norfolk. So all in all, Chairman, there's a lot of work going on. We have a key technical paper under the Environmental Credit Company uh, worked up by Royal Scanning, which will be delivered and dropped around about the same time as the um, Environmental Credit Company's website is launched. So that will detail the ways in which nutrient neutrality mitigation can be delivered. What you will see with the joint venture is a focus a lot um, amongst a suite of nutrient neutrality measures. So natural England are largely being led by nature-based mitigation. There may be some short-term mitigation that may be different, that may not be nature-based from natural England. However, I'm here to speak about Norfolk environmental credits. So I will tell you that Norfolk environmental credits are looking at a whole suite of um, mitigation, some of which will be through working with Anglian Water, who are party to the um, limited company, and they are looking at wastewater treatment plant improvements ahead of 2030, which will be funded by these proposals. We are also looking at the works to private foul water drainage systems, septic tanks on some of our larger estates within Norfolk, because those will actually become more efficient through investment and we can mitigate those. We're reviewing whether or not new consents for solar farms that take land out of agricultural production will also assist with nutrient neutrality. And of course, we're looking at nature-based solutions as well, Chairman. So there's a great deal of work. I'll be happy, I think, Chairman, when we come back after the elections in May to look at another briefing session for Cabinet and if Development Management would like a short briefing session on the joint venture, and of course, I'll be pleased to help out on that as well. Thank you. Uh, and I, uh, am I right in believing that you're, you're meet, having a meeting with agents soon? Will they be updated on that as well? Um, again, Chairman, um, councillors, the, the meeting with agents is the public meeting that I'm talking about. Oh, so okay. um, actually this afternoon, I have okay. a meeting Bye. with yeah. agents, yeah. but we're talking more mainstream planning, Chairman. Yeah, no, thank you. And thank you for the work that you're doing on it. Appreciate it. Thank you. So exclusion of press and public, uh, there's no private business as far as I'm aware. So this meeting is closed. I'd like to thank all of you for being uh, very good members of this committee. It's been, it's been an excellent committee. And I know some of, some of us or some of us here will not be present after the elections. So whatever you're going on to, I hope you, your paths are um, smooth. And uh, I look forward to seeing you on the 16th, I think it is, of, of May. Is it the last final council? 17th. 17th of May. So I'm going to shut up now. Just, uh, just 